Words. I'm Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. Um, if you want to join the conversation, please give us a call, 215-634-8065. That's 215-634-8065. What a day of WRD programming. What a day. We started the day broadcasting live with Solomon Jones from the Greater Philadelphia Martin Luther King Day of Service and uh, uh, did a live hit from, from Temple University during the day. Uh, just, just a day dedicated, uh, one, to acknowledging the extraordinary legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr., but also thinking about the contemporary moment and wrestling with the challenges that face us now and discerning in what ways and really thinking together as a community about what ways um, we can honor the legacy of Dr. King, not just through service, which is important, but also through um, through through our actions and 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 through our work um, and through our commitment uh, to community. So we have an extraordinary show uh, for you this evening. Evening words, a jam packed show. Uh, we, we've got we've got a lot of great folks coming up. I'm looking forward to introducing you to some folks, um, sharing some interviews with you. Uh, but first up, first and foremost, we're going to hear from someone you all know uh, who is vital and very very special uh, to this station, uh, to Black Talk Media, and 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 to the broader Black community. I want to welcome to the program, Sarah Lomax. Hey, James. Hi. Hello, hello. hello. How, how are you? It's been a busy day for your station over here, so I know you've been doing a yeah. lot behind the scenes and, and everything, but how are you today? Happy MLK Day. Thank you. I'm doing great, and um, happy MLK Day to you, too. And I, I have been very plugged in to our programming and just... Um, watching how the team is executing with uh, excellence and I'm I'm just um, I'm kind of beaming over here because um, for many many years as you could imagine I was like in the trenches like doing uh, you know at, at all the broadcasts and putting up pop-up banners and and doing all the things and so it's really it's incredibly gratifying to um, watch and um, observe how the, the, the organization has evolved to, mm. to execute at a, at a really high level. And you're right, we've been out all day. We were at Gerard College. We were at Temple University. And, you know, we were just listening to Al Sharpton, which mm. uh, President Biden was on. And now we have this wonderful special programming um, on your show, and I am. I want to take this moment. The reason I'm here <laughs> um, is to. I said we are going to hear some great interviews on your show, and I didn't mean that um, casually, or it wasn't a slip of the tongue. Mm. Um, I'm mm. very excited to announce and to formally welcome you as the permanent host of Evening Word. Wow. Um, starting today on this auspicious day on Martin Luther King's birthday, his actual birthday. It's rare that we're celebrating King's birthday on his actual Facts. birthday. And so um, we thought that this would be a, a, a very poignant and um, you know, powerful moment to let the listening audience and the community at large know that, um, that you will be in this seat wow. going forward. Thank you, uh, Sarah. You know that I'm I am honored uh, and humbled uh, by the opportunity and the trust I take. Um, you know, sitting in this seat very, very seriously, and um, I'm just excited uh, to 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 be back in the fold, and obviously to to be working with you and the extraordinary team here at WRD. Yes, and we're we're excited, and and as as. All of our like very devoted listeners know we've had a lot of amazing people who have been sitting in that chair since um, since Nick uh, left in the summer, and right. so we've we've had. 
so many uh, wonderful uh, voices and perspectives, and we anticipate keeping all of those voices and perspectives in the, the, the URD universe. Um, but this 4 to 7, Monday through Thursday time slot will, um, will be, uh, you know, Dr. James Peterson's time slot going forward. And one of the things that, that I'm really excited about is the fact that, you know, we are, um, and, and what you're going to be diving into today as, as part of these conversations you're having is we are living in really extraordinary times where we are seeing a retrenchment on so many levels. Um, we have this consequential 2024 presidential election. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania is like absolutely pivotal. Philadelphia is absolutely crucial yep. in how this nation evolves, how, how, mm -hmm. how democracy either, um, you know, continues or, or, uh, get, or it doesn't down. continue. And, right. And, you know, your kind of scholarship, your evenness, your deep respect for our listeners, and um, just the, the, uh, the, the level of discourse that you bring to our airwaves is going to be so important at this incredibly consequential moment in time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, um, I'm very excited that, that we have you in that seat to continue to build out our, our, our times, our, um, our lineup. You know, we have amazing, um, minds and, and voices amazing. throughout the day. That's right. Um, starting at 5 a.m. and going all the way to 9 p.m. and, um, actually till, I'm sorry, midnight That's because right. we've got Tavis Smiley on from 9 to 9 to midnight. That's so, right. Um, yeah, it's, I think that we are in a good position to serve our community and our people well through this and help us navigate these, these very, very turbulent times. Yeah, I think this is part of what I'm excited about and, and also what I'm humbled by, Sarah, which is, and, in, 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 you know, you said it, that the retrenchment, uh, the regressive energy in, in our nation and an opportunity to kind of think with our community about how we rise to the challenge. That's what's so great about MLK Day this year is that there's a charge vested in MLK Day um, to think about his legacy, to think, of course, about the service-oriented piece. That's important. But also to think about how we are going to act, how we're going to respond, how we're going to be proactive in this moment that I think is calling for us to be at the ready uh, to 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 address some 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 of these challenges, but Sarah, I want to. I, I don't have you that for that long. I wonder, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have a great family story about mm -hmm. Dr. King, and I know you shared it before, but I wonder if you would yeah. in, in, share a little bit of that for for the evening words audience on the occasion of of, of MLK Day. Sure, sure. So, um, my father, many people know, was a physician in Philadelphia, and uh, in 1968. Dr. King came to Philadelphia, it was, I think it was February 1968, just a few months before he was assassinated. He came to Philadelphia to speak and to do some organizing, and he fell ill during his time in Philly. And my father was a young physician. He had five kids at that point, um, and it was a Saturday, and, you know, my dad worked all the time. My dad was, <laughs> was a very, very hardworking, diligent um, person. Mm -hmm. And so um, someone from Dr. King's, um, you know, entourage, you know, called my father because he needed, they knew that he was this, you know, young black physician um, in South Philly. And they called him and said, you know, we need you to come check on Dr. King. He's not, he's not feeling well. Wow. And my dad was like, no, nah, I'm like really busy. I, you know, my kids have stuff. I, I I can't do it. Mm. And so he like basically rebuffed them and they persisted. They kept calling him mm. as the story goes and, and really prevailed on my dad to like come and, and see about Dr. King. And, you know, to me, and, and I actually interviewed my father when he was still alive about this story <laughs> and to hear him tell it, it's like, it really puts it in context that Dr. King was not, this towering, towering figure that everyone was like worshiping right. in that moment. He was a guy who my dad, who 
was his peer basically was kind of like, nah, I'm, I'm busy. I can't, I can't make it. Um, but they prevailed upon him. He did, he ended up going, I think it was some kind of motor lodge where Dr. King was staying. And, um, he, you know, my dad basically took care of him. And while he was there, um, there was a photographer there who snapped this picture. It's this very iconic picture of a young Walter P. Lomax Jr. Um, with a stethoscope uh, against Dr. King, a young Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, wow. chest. And wow. it's this, this really, I mean, for our family, it's like a, it's a real treasure. And then Dr. King had written on a, um, uh, a, a prescription pad uh, to the Lomax children to a, it's something like to a, for a bright and noble future, Martin mm. Luther King. Mm. And so we still have that original inscription and, you know, um, we, we use the, the photo of my dad and Dr. King a lot because it, it just was, it was such an iconic moment. And, you know, my dad said that he was just exhausted. Dr. Mm-hmm. King was just, mm-hmm. he had like a, you know, he wasn't like ill, ill, but he had like a flu and he was just, exhausted and the two of them talked about you know the fact that dr king had um had young children i think he had four children my dad had five children i think dr king was a little bit older maybe like three or four years older than my dad Mm -hmm. and um and they they bonded on just being these these youngish black men hard-working black folk hard-working black men you Mm. know just um showing up for each other so it it was um that that's like a beautiful story about just how one how um, this legend and myth that that Dr. King is has has evolved, mm. you know. And we talk a lot about how Dr. King was a pariah at the end of his life. You know, he was speaking out about Vietnam. He that's was right. talking about socioeconomic justice and things that people, black and white people, didn't really want him that's right. talking about. But that's right. he, um, you know, he. He did the work, and, and that, to me, that's the biggest legacy that I see from King is, like, you just have to keep showing up and doing the work day in, day out, and whether you're getting accolades or you're getting, you know, um, darts thrown at you, you you've you got to, like, just keep pushing forward. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, a, um, that's what we have to do in 2024, quite frankly. That is... What I'm here to do uh, on these airways and, and when I'm sitting in the seat is, is put in the work and um, and do it with some humility and, and hopefully with some insight and some information. I'm hoping that, that this program is going to be a news program, um, but it's going to be a program that engages in the kind of critical conversation that I honestly hope will, will advance our community's capacity to think together and to wrestle with all of the challenges um that 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 I think lay ahead for us not just in a presidential cycle but beyond the even the scope the scope of that so I'm again honored and humbled to be here Sarah and I appreciate your your trust in me to 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 take on this important work well we are um equally excited and um, do you want to just run down what you got in store for today? I want to, I want to, I want to be on the line when you. Run yeah, down. so so real exciting show. When we, you know, I'm going to have to let you go because I know you're busy, and then we'll we'll take yeah. a little break and and uh, we'll come back. I recorded an interview earlier today with uh, Dr. Marsha Chatlin at University of Pennsylvania, who's the Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies and also a scholar of civil rights, and she's going to drop some gems about MLK and kind of what the charge is for us going forward, and also some insights around the Civil Rights Act of 1964, like the framework it's established and kind of like how we can think about it in the 21st century. Um, then, of course, I'm going to talk, take some callers and, and talk to some folks, but uh, we'll have a live panel uh, with, with uh, Imani Miles um, from the American History High School in Newark, New Jersey, who will be on with a couple of her students who are uh, uh, young folks who are engaging in this kind of activist work in the legacy of Dr. King. Um, we also are going to have um, uh, Jamal Johnson, 
uh, from Stop Killing Us, who is an incredible activist here in Philadelphia. Uh, that's the brother who did the hunger strike at City Hall to end uh, violence here in the city of, 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 of Philadelphia. Then later on in the program, and I'm super excited about this as well, we're going to have a roundtable of WRD hosts, including Michael Cord, Joanne Bell, Kayla J, and Brother Shamari. And that's just going to be, that's just a WRD uh, brain trust. And then I'll close out, take a couple calls and reflect a little bit more. But we have a jam-packed show, Sarah, a jam-packed show for today. I have no doubt. All right, James. Well, um, welcome and good luck. And uh, I'll be listening. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate you calling and I appreciate you making the announcement and make it official. Absolutely. All right. Take care. All right. You take care. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Wow, folks. Um, So, so you heard it here. Uh, Nick, you heard that, right? With that, we, we, you heard that call, right, Nick? I heard it. I believe it. I heard it with my own ears. And trust me, man, you deserve it. Thank you, brother. I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everybody, on Facebook for, for all the congratulations and, um, and, and, and the shout-outs. And, and um, I, am, I am really excited to be here today uh, because of all the, the, the great things that we have lined up and the great conversations that we have lined up on Evening Words. You are listening to Evening Words. I'm your host, uh, Dr. James Peterson. We're live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. Um, um, folks, I just want to be clear that when I say that this is a humbling moment for me, I'm, I'm really genuine about that. And, and part of that, obviously, is, is the great work that Sarah Lomax and all of the folks here at WRD have been doing for decades now. Um, and part of that is is having the opportunity to be able to engage you, to engage community um, um, around these complicated and, and, and really important issues. Part of that is is being able to be here and, and, and also represent my family and represent my own community um, and, and to be in conversation um, with, with, with folks far and wide ar around these issues. It is it's an honor. Uh, to be here, and, and and my goal is, you know, that that every day um, when I'm sitting in this seat, um, that I have that same energy as the young people say. Every day when I sit in the seat, I want to have that 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 same energy. So I want to I want to give thanks uh, to my mom uh, and to my dad uh, for making this all possible. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my lovely wife, Dr. Belinda Waller Peterson. Um, and, and my children, uh, who I don't even know if my kids are listening right now. They're like, oh, here goes dad to get on that media stuff. Uh, but but it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. It's really exciting. But we have a great program for you today. Um, um, you know, when we come back from this break, I, I pre-taped this interview uh, because Dr. Catlin's schedule, Dr. Catlin's schedule uh, is, you know, like everybody on MLK Day, the folks who do this work, it's been a busy day. I think, I think Ashanti was on my phone at about seven o'clock this morning, getting, getting ready, uh, wrapping up some things for, uh, for today's show. Uh, but, but, but we have that interview. I think Nick has it queued up and, and we'll be tuning into that when we come back. Um, and then we'll we'll progress through 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 the evening. But but again, thank you um, to to Sarah Lomax and the Lomax family, um, and to all my colleagues and, and and all the the producers and all the folks who who do the great work here at WRD. I am extraordinarily excited, happy, and humbled uh, by the opportunity to be a part of this team. You're listening to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD 900 AM, 96.1 FM. We'll be back after these messages. Words of empowerment. Oh, I am Vera Poitier, and I am the founder of Every Heartbeat Counts. Yes. Younger generation, please. Life is short. Love one another. Take care of one another. Advocate for one another. Be kind. We're better together. We are better together. Talk to your parents. Reach out to somebody in 100 black men. You are loved. I know you feel like we're a little disconnected. I'm willing to talk to you and connect with you and just get on the same wavelength. We love you. This is Words of Joy and Empowerment on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media. Audio provided by Love Now Media. These Words of Joy and Empowerment are brought to you by Wells Fargo, Mainline Health, and the Pennsylvania Lottery. 
Approximately every two hours, one Pennsylvanian dies from a drug overdose. These are loved ones, mothers, brothers, grandparents, children, and friends. You never know when you may come across someone experiencing an overdose. Every second counts, and you can save a life by administering naloxone. Learn how to get naloxone by visiting pa.gov backslash opioids. Paid for with Pennsylvania taxpayer dollars. What's on your to-do list? Pick up groceries? Water your plants? How about getting vaccinated? We can help you check that off. You've got this. The Aging and Disability Vaccination Collaborative, powered by U.S. Aging, has partnered with community providers to make getting vaccinated your easiest to do. You've got this. With local vaccine events, access to transportation, in-home vaccinations, and on-site health care consultations, protecting yourself and your loved ones is not a chore anymore. So if you're age 60 plus or a person with a disability, get your yearly dose of confidence today. You've got this. Because yeah, we've, we've got, got you. you. A message from the Aging and Disability Vaccination Collaborative, powered by U.S. Aging. Learn more at yougotthis.usaging.org. You've got this. Funded by the U.S. Administration for Community Living through a grant to U.S. Aging. This does not necessarily represent the views of ACL or the U.S. government. Where's the professor? And now back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media. Uh, welcome to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. I am honored uh, this evening to be in conversation with Professor Marsha Chatlin, the Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Chatlin is an active public speaker, has received numerous awards and honors uh, from the Ford Foundation, from the American Association University of Women, and the German Marshall Fund of the United States. During Professor Chatlin's 12 years at Georgetown University, she won several awards for her teaching and university service, including the 2022 Georgetown Black Alumni Council Distinguished Leader Award. In 2016, the Chronicle of Higher Education named Professor Chatlin a top influencer in academia in recognition of her social media campaign, hashtag Ferguson Syllabus, which implored educators to, to facilitate discussions about the crisis in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. Professor Chatlin, welcome to Evening Words. Thank you so much. It's great to be in conversation with you on this very, very important MLK Day. Um, I know that you'll be in conversation with Professor Dorothy Roberts for the 23rd annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice, where Professor Roberts will be discussing and reflecting on the Civil Rights Act of 64 with, with you. Um, this lecture takes place on Wednesday, January 24th, 2024, at 5.30 p.m. at the Zellerbach Theater on Penn's campus. Professor Chatlin, talk to us a little bit about the occasion of this conversation and some of the things that you are thinking about exploring with the great uh, Dr. Dorothy Roberts. Well, I just want to say thank you for framing the conversation in terms of the Civil Rights Act of 64. You know, um, as people who take seriously uh, Dr. King's legacy, there's so many um, frames to the holiday. You know, oh, it's a day of service. Oh, it's just a day uh, to remember that Dr. King wanted everyone to be nice to each other. There's been such a, a watering down of the complexity, not only of Dr. King, but of the various stages of the movement that I'm glad that we're able to talk about the Civil Rights Act of 64 because it really creates um, a foundation for all of the ways that we think about how we force the federal government to contend with its practices of inequality in the past and the present. So mm -hmm. when most of us think about the Civil Rights Act of 64, we're thinking about lunch counters and movie theaters, but what the act actually does it provides a mechanism for collecting data so we actually know who's being discriminated against or not it creates an an entire array of programs around equity especially in education it lays the foundation for greater focus on voting rights as well as you know the fair housing act which will come right after king's assassination and so our entire framework of what we have a right to how we make claims against the state is really grounded in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, so much so that I think that we don't even acknowledge how it has transformed everyone's relationship to the federal government and the ways that we try to fight against racism. 
Wow. So, I mean, there, there, you're adding so many dimensions to, to my understanding even of the Civil Rights Act that I'm sure our listeners are, 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 are going to be uh, wanting to sort of key in on. When you talk about that framework that's established, you know, help, help our listeners kind of understand why the Civil Rights Act is still really important uh, in 2024, even though it was established in 1964. Well, because um, the courts and the federal government continue to play games with it is basically why it's so important. You know, it, it, none of it was finalized or was a done deal that says everyone will have equal access. What it says is, here are the mechanisms to try to make a claim when there isn't equal access. Here are the ways that we go after private businesses. Here are the ways that we go after public resources. And I think it's so important to remember, especially on the King holiday, that the Civil Rights Act of 64 was really a way of trying to get the federal government to take responsibility, but it was also evolving in the context of a war on poverty, where you know the Johnson administration is taking seriously that the federal government has a role to play in ensuring that people have access to food, to jobs, to job training, to education. And so when we put that in the context of what was happening in the country in 64 and the ways that King was also trying to think about what the movement needed, it's a really powerful piece of legislation that I think, you know, when we look at the specificity of it, it really alerts us to just how desperate, you know, people were and how, much, how many needs were being unfulfilled during that time. And for today, you know, that, that Civil Rights Act of 64 is constantly, you know, in our, um, in front of us, because when we think about how do we make claims around issues of access to education, there's still school desegregation cases that are being heard by the court. There's still challenges about apprenticeship programs and who's getting in them and who's not getting in them. And so, you know, we might have think that we might think to ourselves, okay, the days of, you know, people having to fight to get served a hamburger are over, kind of, but there are a number of places in which this act becomes really important for how people organize and how people attack discrimination. Mm, thank you for that, Dr. Chandler. I, I, I'm curious, I want to talk a little bit about your research. Um, and obviously, I mean, the Ferguson syllabus was such a powerful document that blew up on social media, but also shaped the kind of ways in which a lot of folks were teaching into civil rights kinds of movements in the 21st century. Can you talk about how, how your research has evolved through your understanding of the civil rights movement and how you make that manifest for the challenges that we still face in the 21st century? Well, one of the things I'm always um, so fascinated with is how do we imagine change happening and how do we mark a success or a failure? You know, my last book, Franchise the Golden Arches of, in Black America, I talk about how you know, some people believe that the next great frontier for civil rights was going to be business ownership. And that's how we get a lot of fast food restaurants in black neighborhoods. And then people say, wait a second, that didn't quite do what we thought it was going to do. We have to revise our vision. And I think that when we look at, for instance, the fight around um, police killings and the lack of structure for police accountability all over this country, you know, during that period of time, during the Ferguson uprisings, the question is, will this movement replicate some of the same uh, ways of thinking about civil rights as they did in the 60s? And they didn't for very good reason. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about legislative victories, when we think about, okay, if a municipality says you have to have body cameras, you know, what are the things that aren't captured by body cameras that we also have to think about? And I think in terms of the civil rights movement, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 64 was a major, major step to end segregation, but it didn't, you know, it didn't finish the work. And so I think that, you know, for me, my research really focuses on what are the things that we celebrate? What are the things that we bemoan and we regret? And how movements are really just people who are like our students, you know, they're just always reflecting and thinking and going back and really needing the support and the grace to grow. No one gets it right the first time. And I think that that's a constant reminder. And I think that's why history is, can be such um, a soothing tool when we feel uh, we are in despair. No one gets it right the first time, but every generation takes up the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, you're listening to Evening Words on 900 AM, 96.1 FM. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. I'm in conversation with Professor Marsha Chatlin, the Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, who will be in conversation 
with Professor Dorothy Roberts this Wednesday at the Zellerbach Theater on Penn's campus. Dr. Chaplin, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the history, because you're talking about like just normal people making big things happen. What role did Dr. King and other activists have in, in getting the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed in the first place? You know, so much about social change is about concerted efforts, long struggles, and then, you know, timing, which we don't always have control over. So when we think about you know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it really was a far more aggressive attempt to dealing with the issue of civil rights because of Johnson's perspective on civil rights and how it differed uh, than uh, John F. Kennedy. I think that, you know, in the rearview mirror, people have thought of John Kennedy as such a champion for civil rights, and he was incredibly timid on the topic. And essentially what happens when we think about the March on Washington happening in 1963, part of the platform was a civil rights bill. And it didn't have the level of specificity. It didn't have all the provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 64. It didn't have a provision for sex discrimination, but it had a vision that the federal government was going to end the practices in the states that were intolerable, that were economically inefficient, that were disrespectful. We lost Dr. Chatlin. Uh, we're going to hold on and see if we can sort out some of these technical difficulties. You're listening to Evening Words. I'm your host, uh, Dr. James Peterson. Uh, we are on 900 AM, 96.1 FM, and we're in conversation with Professor Marsha Chatlin, who is the Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Chatlin will be in conversation with Penn Professor Dorothy Roberts for the 23rd annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice. Professor Roberts will be reflecting on the Civil Rights Act of 64, which is what our conversation is about uh, this evening. The lecture takes place Wednesday, January 24th, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. at the Zellerbach Theater on Penn's campus. This event is presented by the Center for Africana Studies, the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society, Department of Sociology, the Penn Population Studies Center, and the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. Professor Chatlin, I'm glad we were able to get you back here. Um, we were just in the midst of the conversation about how ordinary folks can make big things yes. happen. And you were talking about Dr. King and other activists in, in, in the work they did to, to get the civil rights of 1964 passed. So one of the things that we have to remember about the Civil Rights Act of 64 passing, it happens under a year from the March on Washington. And the roots of the March on Washington are in World War II when A. Philip Randolph and others are trying to get the federal government to commit to di eliminating discrimination in the federal workforce. So when you think about all those factors, it's like a movement that's decades old has this grand march on Washington. You have a Kennedy administration that isn't really pro-civil rights, but they're very nervous about the implications and the optics of the march. Mm -hmm. And then you have the assassination of a president, right? So these are all of these factors that no one could plan for, but the diligence and the relentlessness of the movement allows for it to articulate itself at the right moment. Mm -hmm. And so much about American political history, so much about civil rights movement is about timing. It's about having an infrastructure that is ready to move when a big event happens, when there is a shift in public opinion, when the poignancy of a civil rights martyrship allows for people to continue the conversation at a deeper level. And so when we think about the Civil Rights Act of 64, you know, some, some people point to it as a moment where, um, you know, of bipartisanship, or some people point to it as the, you know, the savvy of the folks who negotiated for it. But it's also about the global politics of the time. And it's also about the domestic politics of the time. It's about a shift in the White House. And I think that taking all of those factors into consideration, it's pretty amazing when change actually happens because there's so many factors that contribute to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that, is, that is so true. As, as you kind of think about what the Civil Rights Act did accomplish initially and what it hasn't accomplished up to this point, how do you kind of chart the future 
of that framework that that you talked about the the, the this 1964 civil rights act establishing uh for all of us to think through some of these challenging social justice issues you know i think it i think it raises our consciousness about um the precarity of all of these Uh, I think we lost. Oh, did you lose me? Okay, yeah, I'm yeah, back. You're, you're talking about the precarity of it all. I think that what this, what these acts, and particularly what the Civil Rights Act of 64 reminds us, is that this is precarious business because Supreme Courts interpret the act differently in different periods of time. There'll be new challenges to what does civil rights mean when we have emerging technologies, when we have changes in people's immigration status in the United States, uh, when we have presidents who um, don't believe in civil rights, when we have attorneys general that don't believe in civil rights, right? So I think it reminds us that the action and the celebration that surround any type of civil rights victory has to be tended um, so carefully mm -hmm. um, with relentless action and that, you know, we have to have the right balance of direct action on the ground protest and we have to have mechanisms that train and support the attorneys who are also part of this fight. You know, I think that um, there's there's all sorts of, um, in the world that I live in, in the world that Professor Roberts lives in, you know, there are always these people discerning, how do you make a difference? Where should I be? And, you know, my answer is be wherever you need to be where your talents can allow you to animate the necessity and the importance of an issue. We need attorneys, we need educators, we need people on the ground, we need protesters, we need people who are willing to kind of take up the fight at the place that they're at so that we're in a constant um, state of motion. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Challen, we are grateful that you are one of the active public intellectual and scholarly stewards of this legacy. And we're also really, really grateful that you took some time out of your busy schedule to talk to us here at Evening Words. All right, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We've been in conversation with Professor Marsha Chatlin, who is the Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, an active public speaker and award-winning scholar, um, and the author and founder of, of the hashtag Ferguson Syllabus. Professor Chatlin will be in conversation with Penn Professor Dorothy Roberts for the 23rd annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice where Professor Roberts will reflect on the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in conversation with Professor Chatlin. The events presented by the Center of Africana Studies, the Penn Program on Race, Science and Society, the Department of Sociology, the Penn Population Studies Center, and the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. It takes place this Wednesday, January 24th, 2024 at 5.30 p. at the Zerlebach Theater on Penn's campus. You're listening to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are on WRD. That was my conversation with uh, Professor Marsha Chatlin, the Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. I, I got the dates mixed up on that interview, so I just want to clarify that Professor Chatlin will be in conversation with Professor Dorothy Roberts for the 23rd annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice on January 24th. January 24th at 5.30 p. at the Zellerbach Theater on Penn's campus. It's sponsored by the Center for Africana Studies and a host of other entities and units of departments, including the U University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School at, at, at UPenn. That conversation was really incredible, and I hope it sets the table for us for the conversations that we will continue to have this evening. You are listening to evening words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. If you want to join the conversation, the phone lines are going to be open for a little while, folks. If you want to join the conversation, please give us a call at 215-634-8065. That's 215-634-8065. We'll be back after these messages. Want the latest in word swag? Check out the shop tab on wordradio.com. Hoodies, tees, and more in a variety of colors. It's the shop tab on wordradio.com. You can look good and show the world that you're all about. Black Talk Media. 
Looking for a career in public health? PHMC is a nonprofit public health institute with over 3,000 employees in the Philadelphia region. Public Health Management Corporation will host their first virtual career fair of 2024, Wednesday, January 17th, 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. This career fair will highlight positions in special education services. Log on to mypublichealthcareer.org to register. Mypublichealthcareer.org. Wednesday, January 17th, 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. Find the right opportunity for you. Get it, slip it, cuff it, check it. Talk to doctor now and share it. Nearly one in two U.S. adults have high blood pressure. That's why it's important to self-monitor your blood pressure in four easy-to-remember steps. It starts with a monitor. Be next to talk to your doctor about your blood pressure numbers. Get down with your blood pressure. Self-monitoring is power. Visit ManagerBP.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council, the American Heart Association, and the American Medical Association. In partnership with the Office of Minority Health and Health Resources and Services Administration. WURD is celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his own words. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up, and wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same, we want to be free. This Martin Luther King vignette was brought to you by Comcast, the Pennsylvania Lottery, Pico, Keystone First, and the Philadelphia Water Department. Don't forget to join Word Radio this Monday, January 15th, as we continue to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And now back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, 900 AM and 96.1 FM, Philadelphia. Welcome back to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We're live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. If you want to join the conversation, please give us a call, 215-634-8065. That's 215-634-8065. I hope you all will bear with me. As we, we just made the official announcement today, I still have the urge to say guest host. Um, it's, it's not because I don't now know that I'm hosting and understand what the assignment is. It's just the habit of, of, of having guest hosted for, for a little while. What an incredible conversation, though, with uh, Professor Chatlin. And I, and I just want to uh, thank her and, and really appreciate that, that f the, the framing of the Civil Rights Act. One, to, to help us to kind of understand the, the kind of quotidian, the day-to-day -day work that's required uh, to advance civil rights uh, for, for people in this country. And, and that although that framework was established some 60 years ago or so, we still have a lot of work to do. And, and, and again, we're, we're honoring um, one of the key figures who who helped to establish that, um, but but we are also taking quite seriously the challenge and the charge uh, for 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 what lays ahead. And and and, and again, if you want to join this conversation, please give us a call uh, 215-634-8065. That's 215-634-8065. Just some of the things to think about in terms of that challenge and that charge. You know, they rolled back Roe v. Wade. The, the and, and 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 I don't want to get into the Trump world, but the Trump Supreme Court rolled back Roe v. Wade, directly impacting the reproductive rights of women all over this country. And I know this this is a complicated issue. It is, and and I hope that over the course of of my time in the seat, we'll be able to explore it in more depth and and with experts um, at the ready to teach me and to teach us about the complications of it. But when you look at the data. Infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates in the black community, I think it's crystal clear that when you roll back reproductive rights, it has a disparate impact in the African-American community. That, that's something we have to talk about. You already know that in some of my guest hosting duties, I've been in discussion and been debating about the rolling back of affirmative action. Right? These, these are policies. I, I might have been able to imagine that affirmative action would get rolled back. I would not have ever imagined that Roe v. Wade would be reversed 
in my lifetime. And 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 that's just two of, of two hundred thousand issues that that we've got to take up and, and, and like I always say, we've got to be prepared to to think together about in order to do this work. But I, I got to get to the phone lines because it's a lot of folks here and we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we're going to go to Germantown Joe. Germantown Joe, welcome to Evening Words. Good evening, Dr. Peterson, to your wonderful producer, Brother Nicholas. Happy MLK Day. Happy MLK Day. You know, before I talk about Dr. King real quick, I, I congratulate I want to be the first one to congratulate Dr. <laughs> Dr. Peterson. And remember Thank last you, week, when I told you last week, I said, when are you going to play your theme music? You said, well, Brother John can't do it because it's not my show yet. But now, starting tomorrow, you're going to officially play that beautiful theme music. Starting tomorrow. Am I right or wrong? You, 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 you're right, Germantown Show, but I'm not changing the theme music for this. We, you know, we, we are in full production mode here at Evening Words, and, and we'll have some segments some different things. There will be, hopefully, some original music. But we're going to keep the title music as it is for right now, Jim. But I, okay. I appreciate the love, brother. Go ahead. No problem at all. No problem. Well, anyway, like I said, I enjoy your interview with Sister Sarah and everything. Thank and you, you notice when you interviewed Dr. Chatwick, she said about this country playing games. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and see, this is why I keep trying to see people get upset with me. For people are like, I'm, I'm going to be real. I'm not going to sugarcoat. I'm not going to be here and, and be no butt kisser for the Democrat <laughs> Party. No, no more than I'm going to be for the Republican Party. Joe Biden is playing games. Now, think about this, Dr. Peterson. He brought his sorry behind in Philadelphia today, him and his wife, right? Now, he slipped there. I think he was at Phil Abundance or something. Him and his wife serving meals or whatever. Yes. Now, if he was sincere, he could have came two weeks ago with no fans, he could have slipped in and, and, and served the people down there. And we might have not known about it for like maybe a week later. He said, well, you know, President Biden and his wife came in. They, they served meals. They did it quietly. He waited on Dr. King's birthday, right, where all the cameras going to be there for fanfare because he want to pep off of black folks and stuff like that because he realized his sorry behind can't win without the black community. So he going to get folks and stuff. But he can't get nothing past. Like, like, again, I'm quoting Dr. Chadwick. He play games with black people. He can't. He can get an anti-Asian hate bill passed. Some of that white uh, coward shot the beautiful Asian sisters down in Atlanta. He, him and his cronies had no problem getting that bill passed, just like that. But when it comes to black people, and again, it, and it should have been passed because Asian people, like anyone else, need protection. Our Palestinian sisters and brothers need protection and humanity over there. He can't get nothing done for us, but... But, 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 but yet he had, had no problem getting that bill passed for Asian people. And, I, and again, I have no problem with that. But he can't get the George Floyd bill passed. He get the John Lewis bill passed. Your most loyal constituents, like Malcolm said, you put the Democrat Party first, they put you last. I mean, we got to stop... We got to stop Dr. Peterson going for the show. We got to demand better because we do our people a disservice. This man can come to Mount Emanuel Church where our people got murdered at and talk about some king and all that stuff while he while he complicit in genocide in Palestine. He can sit there and talk about voting and all that stuff. He can't he he can't get a bill and he can get it passed. Dr. Peterson, I close it this. Way. I want to be selfish with my with your time. He he can get anything he passed. He walks with Joe Biden is a, a veteran politician, shrewd as he may be. He, he know where all the bodies and bones and bodies are buried. He can work and he can make deals. Cause watch what white boys do. They make deals. He can make deals with his racist friends on the other side of the aisle. And even the biggest that's in the Democrat Party, the yeah. conservative group. He can make deals with them and get the joke. George Floyd bill passed and the, and the John Lewis bill if he really wanted to do it. Because he don't have no, he got cowardly black leadership that's not going to push him. And many of these niggas out here today plotting Dr. King, his legacy, but some of these same Negroes are silent by Palestinian men, women, and children being slaughtered as we speak. They're being silent. Yet they'll be plotting Dr. King, but they'll have enough courage to push Biden and say, look, man, you want to stop that genocide over there, uh, Biden? And number two, we, we tired of your games and stuff like Dr. Chatwood said. We want that bill passed no matter how you get to touch elbows with your white boys on the Republican or Democrat thank, side. Thank get that George Floyd bill passed and get it passed now. And exactly th what's thank you, Brother Joe. You know, I got a lot of folks on hold, so I got to keep it moving. I'm going to go to Prince from Schuylkill. Prince, welcome to Evening Words. Congratulations. Thank you, brother. I appreciate we it. Definitely appreciate that because now, so we need a we need a villain, and we need a hero. And so we're gonna let you wear the hero cape for a minute, and we're gonna be the villain until we overtake overtake you in conversation at some point in time. So, so, so you gotta explain something to me because now you're accountable because this is your time slot. No one ever asked him or who gave him permission to say that. If you don't vote for him, you're not black enough. That's number one. That's the first question I need you to answer or articulate so I can understand. Who gave Joe Biden 
the uh, the ability. Yeah, I, I got the I got the question. Let's get the next one, brother. You know, I got a lot of people on hold right now in a little bit of time. Go ahead. And, 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 the, and the second one is the second one is sixty years later, you're trying to frame in something that hadn't been done under anybody watch all this time is disingenuous. And why should we trust the league or support your initiative in this in this framework that was done sixty years ago that never had gotten accomplished and Without the doctor behind your name, all of these athletes who have multi millions of dollars, who buy twenty million dollar yachts, why haven't we networked with them like Lou Alcinda and 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 um um um, um, um about five other football athletes, yep. Muhammad Ali, they all come together to have a conversation. So I think it's disingenuous to put somebody quote unquote historian, quote unquote doctor, when you got a, a whole slew of people who make millions of dollars without those degrees. And you can't get them to the table so we can get them to support it. I'm going to get off. That's I got you. Thank, thank, you thank you, Brother Prince. Congratulations. Thank you, Brother Prince. I appreciate it. So, so number one, uh, Joe Biden had no business saying that. Joe Biden had no business saying that. No, no, no matter what you've done or how long you've been in politics, you, you know, you're not the arbiter of blackness. And neither is any one particular individual in this world. Now, I can go on and on about blackness, but I don't have time. I don't have time. So he had no business saying that. To your second point, you know, I – first you know i don't i don't serve in the same role or move in the same lane as some of the athletes you're talking about but i i would i would certainly ask you to do your homework on on kareem abdul jabbar uh on on muhammad ali some of those older generation athletes you're mentioning to look at the work that they did and what they put on the line and what they continue to do uh before before we judge them i agree with you that there probably is or there is just more opportunity for partnership across these athletes that are that are doing a lot of great things and and have a lot of financial potential um but i you know it's about who you're talking about i mean you know lebron james has done some great things you know some of these athletes have done some great things but brother prince i think where you and i probably differ is i don't think that economic power and economic development is the sole sort of means through which we are going to close all the gaps and achieve actual justice, not charity, but justice in this nation for, for, for black girls. We're going to go, go to Derek on line three. Derek, welcome to Evening Words. Okay, I'll try to be as, uh, <laughs> I don't have too much time, I take it. But anyway, uh, on that public accommodation, fact, uh, somebody said uh, they were blaming Martin McCain for shutting down a lot of the black businesses, but I think the same thing they tend to forget. My mother was telling me when she was driving, she and father got out of the service, he drove all the way from uh, Jersey, and to uh, they were driving to Colorado. That's where she was from. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mother was telling me she had to stop in Nebraska, and the people said, "We don't serve your type." And mother was furious. And the whole thing was not to sit around with a bunch of white people and eat with them, but it was just your human dignity. I mean, because uh, there's a lot of parts. If you're back where you are, they may have a lot of blacks, but you come up uh, west of the Mississippi River, you don't have a lot of black people. In those areas, mm -hmm. you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, but like I said, is also uh, somebody said some of the businesses uh, they went down. But I think a lot of the times it was not so much the black people that stopped supporting them. It's just that a lot of times the business, somebody was telling me the businesses weren't good because they couldn't get business loans. They might need. Uh, it's kind of like that. Uh, uh, I don't know if you saw the sketch Eddie uh, Murphy did on Saturday Night Live. They had Mr. Black, Mr. White. Mm -hmm. Mr. Black goes in there, and they said, uh, by the way, uh, uh, he has all his paperwork. They said, no, we can't help you. Mr. White comes in there, and he's dressed in a white face, and he says, do I need to show you my ID? No. Right. And he says, I need $50,000 or $100,000. He said, $100,000. Right. And how do I need to pay you back? He said, well, pay us back whenever you can. Right. Don't even worry about it. No, no, brother Doug, I gotta let you go, but I, I understand I understand the question. I think I think that you're talking right. about something that's a little more complicated, which is the impact of desegregation and movements geared towards integration on on black businesses. Um and there are lots of stories around this. I mean Durham, North Carolina, where I went to undergrad, um, is one of those kinds of cities, the kind of city that had a thriving sort of black uh, a set of economic businesses that that after 
um, 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 uh, desegregation and after black folks were able to patronize other businesses, it had, it had a, a deleterious impact on those black businesses. It, it, it's, that, that's a complicated piece. I wish I had more time to go into it, but I, I wouldn't lay that at the feet of Dr. King, though. Um, there is a whole movement around around desegregation and a whole movement around integration uh, that's worth talking about but one thing i will say is this is a topic i want to come back to it's worth us talking about it we're going to we're going to take brother maurice before we go to break brother maurice welcome to evening words you know we're short on time but i wanted to get you in brother because when we come back from the break we're going to take our guests well first of all that brother was wrong there was nobody black getting no loans for no buses back then <laughs> and second of all we thought the water was colder riding the, the the white bus instead of putting like 900 bus companies out of business. So let's get the facts straight. But listen, the day of service, right? Well, that's part of it. I don't think that should be the whole thing, but yes. I'm yeah. using the title. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The service was, it was a photo op that was going on at Gerard College today. There was no day of service. That was day to show, hey, black people, you know we're, uh, like how George say, Mr. Charlie, and we got these black faces showing up, but when were all those black faces when we needed them about some serious issues on everyday circumstances? Can't find them. But they can show up there on one day. Nobody can even wash Dr. King's underwear. No, we don't have anybody like that no more because when you're a civil, true civil rights, rights leader, you have to make a sacrifice. Your family your livelihood, and, the, and your life. So all these people that want to act like they so-called civil rights leaders, they're living in luxury. They're paying to be guided. Somebody's paying them to suggest... So, Brother Maurice, hold on, Brother Maurice. You, you know my question is coming right to you, which That's is... Why, why you put me last, though? <laughs> listen, listen, my wait, question... Wait a minute, wait a minute, I got to say this first. Go ahead. You want to pay me now or pay me later? <laughs> yeah, I'm not paying anybody. I want to. I have a question for you. About, right? I have a question for you. I have a question for you. You know, what, what, what kind of work do you do in the civil rights space that you think is a model for what people should be doing if you're saying they're just showing up to events or just if they're all talking and not a lot of acting, what, what is the kind of work that counts for you? Thing. When, when, I, when I first start working up at Grady Free Prison, mm -hmm. my job there is making sure that black inmates got the same courtesy that white inmates got. Okay. And white, in, in, and white guards will play tricks on black inmates, but I go by the book. Whatever in that book they're supposed to get, I made sure they got it, no matter who told me not to give it to them. Okay, brother. So I did my part. Plus, I risked my job when they told me, if you go to the Million Man March, you're fired. So mm. what I do, I recruited 30 white guards to go with me. Okay. So, and so you, why I say, you going to pay me now or later? Hey, listen, listen, I'm not paying anybody at all. I, I just, I asked that because, again, when I'm sitting in the seat, when we levy critique, especially broad-based critique like you just did about about the uh, the King National piece of Gerard College, I just want to make sure that I understand the terms of the discussion. So you're saying that that the work that you did in the mass incarceration in, in the prison industrial complex counts as civil rights work because you advocated for black prisoners that were there and you took a stand and put your job on the line i just want to understand the terms of the discussion now look i gotta go to break i got you brother maurice i'm here so you and i are gonna have plenty of times to talk good brother you're listening to evening words i'm your host dr james peterson we are live on wrd 900 am 96.1 fm we're going to hold the calls for a little bit folks because we got some special guests coming on that i will introduce to you right after these messages here's what you missed on wake up with word we're joined now by Governor Josh Shapiro. Um, what does the legacy of Dr. King mean in your view? I think it means service and that we each have a responsibility in that service and that it is a constant work in progress. Let me give you an example um, that's fitting for where we sit here today, Solomon. The Civil Rights Act was passed 60 years ago. A year after it was passed, Dr. King was right here at Girard College where we sit today with Cecil B. Moore, a great local civil rights leader, working for more equity in our school system. 
that proves the point that we always have to keep working at this. Civil Rights Act was passed. You'd think everything was done, right? Everything was done. We, we don't need to work anymore. But Dr. King understood it was a constant work in progress. And so I think for me, that's what I've always taken from his legacy. There are so many individual things that he fought for that are critically important. But the fact is he just kept fighting. And that is what I took from it, and I try and do my part every single day in, in the work I do as governor. Tune in to Wake Up With Word with Solomon Jones every Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., only on WURD. Progressive Black Talk Media. Hey, girl, what are you doing here? Aren't you going to be late for work? Yeah, girl, I had to get my coffee and my lottery tickets. You still play the lottery? You think you're going to win? Says who? There's always a chance. Besides, even if I don't win, I'm helping out older Pennsylvanians in my community with each lottery ticket I buy. How so? Well, the PA Lottery was started as a way to fund programs for seniors in our state. They've contributed over $30 billion to many programs. $30 billion with a B? Yes, billion. The money goes to programs for property tax and rent rebates, free or reduced rides, low-cost prescriptions, home care services, and more. I had no idea. Yep, the PA Lottery is the only state lottery whose proceeds benefit older citizens. You know what? I think I'll get a few lottery tickets, too. There you go. Could you give me a coffee while you're at it? Hmm. Players must be 18 or older. Please play responsibly. Problem gambling? Helpline 1-800-GAMBLER. We've all felt left out. And for people who move to this country, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Want the latest in Word swag? Check out the shop tab on wordradio.com. Hoodies, tees, and more in a variety of colors. It's the shop tab on wordradio.com. You can look good and show the world that you're all about black talk media. We are the home of progressive black talk media. This is WURD, 900 AM and 96.1 FM, Philadelphia. Streaming online on Where's the professor? Here we go. And now back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media. Welcome back to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. I am really excited. Uh, to welcome to the program an incredible roundtable of extraordinary young people and their teacher. Y'all know I'm an educator, right? And their teacher. So please give it up for Imani Miles, who's a social studies teacher at American History High School in Newark, New Jersey, and several of Professor Miles's students, Naila Hughes, Inara Davis, and Tamia Hardy. And first and foremost, Naila Inara and Tamia, to, to, to I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your names correctly. So, 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 am I pronouncing your names correctly? Uh, my name is Nyla Hughes. It's Nyla. Nyla. Just Nyla. Thank <laughs> you, Nyla. Uh, my name is Tamaya. Tamaya. See, Tamaya. see, y'all. That's why I got to ask. Thank you, Tamaya. And my name is Inara Davis. Inara. See, see. I, there's no phonetic spellings in the names, right? So I had to make sure I, I, I got it right. Um, uh, Miss Miles, I, I want to start with you. First of all, thank you so much for 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 bringing these extraordinary young activists onto the program um, to talk a little bit about uh, MLK's legacy and the work that they're doing. But I wonder, first, if we could talk a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about about um, American History High High School and 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 your role there as a social studies teacher. Of course, um, you know I'm, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity, um, especially for. My students, you know, this is their first time doing something like this, and I thought it would be an amazing opportunity um, for them to get active and to get their voices heard. Um, so American History High School is a public magnet school in the city of Newark, New Jersey, and it's a school for social justice and democracy. And um, I'm a first-year social studies teacher. I just graduated law school. I'm very passionate about um, education and about history in particular. And so my students are members of the very first Black Student Union at our school, and I have them for Latin American history, and I'll also be teaching African American history and um, work history as well. 
that that that's incredible. Um, this is for Miss Hughes, Miss Davis, and Miss Hardy. Can you all share with our audience a little bit about how you develop the idea for the Black Student Union? There's a lot of folks in listening who who've either been a member of a Black Student Union when they were in college or know what it is. But talk about the, the, your journey in terms of of developing this important organization at American History High School. Um, I'll go first. Um, I didn't really know much about um, Black Student Union. My um, lovely teacher, Miss Miles, opened the opportunity to us. And we were really all ears. Like, it was just a new opportunity for us. Like, I don't know. It was just something new for us. And I feel like it was very encouraging. So us coming in, like, we learned more. And the more that she was teaching us, the more we became more engaged in bringing other people to the Black Student Union. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nyla. Tamaya or Anara, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, yes. Um, it just builds a community. Like, we could build a community within our school, build a community within our city, build a community around the world. Like, we just connect with our African-American brothers and sisters, and I just love that. Mm -hmm. It gives us the opportunity to learn to think that we don't really learn in a classroom as far as our history because mm -hmm. that's important and discuss. So. Mm -hmm. Ms. Davis? Um, I guess she really heard all of her students. Like, Ms. Miles really hear her students. So when she heard us over, like, over talking about it, she thought and brought us the idea of the BSU, which we can all be in a community together and all be unified because that's really all we really want. Like we really want to be unified with our youth and make sure we understand and know that it's not only one person going through it, like we're all going through it and we all want to be unified. Mm. Mm, I love that, unity. Um, that, that's one of those Kwanzaa uh, principles. Uh, Miss Miles, can, can you sort of share with us your vision. I'm assuming you're the advisor of this of this newly formed Black Student Union. Talk a little bit about your vision. And, and, and I want to put this in context because a lot of folks don't always appreciate this nuance about our history. But there's a long history in the black community of teachers and students working together around around activism issues. So 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 Ms. Miles, talk a little bit about what your vision is for for these young activists uh, um, um, uh, that you're mentoring. Um, of course, you know, uh, our very first meeting, I, I mentioned to the students about the history of, of um, not only Black student unions across the country, but also about Black studies. And I specifically mentioned Jimmy Garrett and other students who were part of um, the student movement at San Francisco State University. Um, this idea that students should have access to um, their history, but also to the tools that they can use to transform their society. And so for me, as an advisor, it's about letting students know that they have an immense amount of power. Um, and of course, I want them to be educated about our history, you know, educated about the true legacy of folks like Dr. King, who, you know, the narrative is so often co-opted, but this real, true history of the people that um, are so often left out of the narrative. And so for me, it's just about giving them the power, the skills, and the tools to be able to create change within their community, but also just a safe space to be young, gifted, and black. Mm, mm. Ms. Miles, one, one quick follow-up, because a lot of folks are probably wondering this. You have a JD, you went to law school, and so you, mm -hmm. you, have, you have options in your career, other professional trajectories that you could take. What made you decide to be an educator? Well, for me, I came, I had phenomenal educators. Um, I went to Seton Hall University and my professors, you know, I'm a black studies baby. So like for me, I had amazing professors who, you know, kind of like adopted me into a, a radical tradition. And I want to be able to expose this, the children and the youth to what I, what I was exposed to at, at a very young age. And they're our future. Like people don't listen to kids. People don't listen to students. And I'm here to, to tell them that how they feel is, you know, is important and that they're extremely powerful. Whether they sometimes don't feel like it all the time, but they most definitely are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is for Ms. Hughes, Ms. Davis, and Ms. Hardy. 
Uh, t talk a little bit about what some of the things, what are some of your goals in this organization? We, you know, we obviously you're interested in community and, 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 and uh, sort of building uh, together as, as an organization, but are there, do you have an agenda? Are there specific issues? Are there things that are going on um, um, in your school or y'all know I'm from North New Jersey too. So, or, or in your, in your community, are there things that are going on in your school or in your community that you want to be able to address uh, through, through the Black Student Union? And we'll just, we'll start with Ms. Hardy and go right around, right around the, the horn there. Um, absolutely. Like we have goals within our school. Um, we've made a petition. We tried to make things better as far as come together as a community. Um, yeah, absolutely. I feel like we want to make change. We want to come together. We want to, when a situation comes up, we want to know what's the right thing to do, how to go about it, and how we can solve our issues together. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's the main goal, like together. Like that's our big word. Mm -hmm. So Maya, what was, the, what was that petition for? Um, so some of the students in our school, we feel as though we're not treated equally. Um, we feel as though we're not heard. We don't have a voice. We don't have support. When it comes to like extracurriculars, mm -hmm. um, especially things that go on in a school, like our school. <laughs> it's okay. Take your time. Take your time. It's okay. Listen, it's emotional. It's okay. Um, in our school, we feel as though we learn. Like, when it comes to learning, we got that in the bag. But it's just like, when it comes to other things, as students, we just feel as though we're not heard. Mm -hmm. And we don't have really have a support system. So that's why the petition was wrote. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Hughes or, or Ms. Davis, do you want to weigh in on that, on the petition, and, and, and making sure that you all have a voice? at your institution? Um, I'll go. Um, with the thing with the petition, I feel like <clears throat> it was a way for us to really get our voices heard. And unfortunately, it didn't go that way. And now that we're <clears throat> in the BSU, I feel like it's helped us build our confidence and like what we're really supposed to be doing as a community to really get our voices heard. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to speak about is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, why is it's important for people our age to be activists, like for us to really speak and like know what it means to be an activist. And like, we're not going to be heard if we don't speak up for ourselves alone. Like us as teenagers, we have a lot of power, but it's like, especially in the black community, not people are scared to really like show their true cause and like who they really are. Like in our school, there are a lot of kids who don't really apply themselves to their best ability. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what also holds us back because I was once that way too, but Miss Miles has really helped me come out of my shell. And I feel like because we are the future generation, we are the future. It's like mm -hmm. our voices matter. We need to be heard and we need to have people around us that are willing to motivate us and really push us to where we have to be so that we can be heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nyla. I, I, Nara, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, like I said before, Ms. Miles, she hears her students and she heard us. So I feel like if we get our voices out there and become a support system for each other, we'll really, you know, fall in and rely on each other because I feel like that's the most important thing is having a support system because if you don't have a support system, you're going to always feel like nobody really wants to listen or care about how you feel. And Ms. Miles, she cared about how we feel, and she most definitely got us out of our shell. I'm more able to, you know, speak about how I'm feeling and get it off my chest, as with in the BSU, we all get what we're feeling off our chest, even if we're disagreeing with each other or agreeing with each other. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I feel like we most definitely need a support system, and with young people, we understand each other more than, you know, probably they'll say the adults. So I feel like we most definitely need that. Mm -hmm. I, I have a follow up question for you, Nyla, and, and this is for any of you all to, to answer because you said something that I think is really important for our listeners to understand, which is you all are concerned about students in your school who 
are underperforming and maybe for some reason or are not applying themselves. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old head. Okay. I'm 52 years old and, and I've, I've raised two children who are college grads, but I also sometimes wonder like, what is it that we're doing or not doing in our education system that is making young people like yourselves, you know, kind of check out, you know, obviously Miss Miles has inspired you all to apply yourselves, which is a beautiful thing, Miss Miles, absolutely beautiful work. But, but Nyla, you first, and then I would love uh, for Tamaya and Anara to also weigh in on this. Can you share with our audience a little bit more about like what you think makes a young person check out from applying themselves every day in, in, in school? Um, I would say the lack of motivation. I feel like we need people to, that's willing to pour into us. Like, as young people right now, we just came out of COVID. Like, many people, like, they lost a lot during that time. So it's just like, I feel like they kind of lost hope. Like, I'm not sure, like, education-wise, like, mentally. But I feel like it all plays a part. Like, we need someone that is willing to pour into us. And it's like, I feel like kids nowadays, like, they draw more to social media and, like, games and stuff like that like you i feel like the adults aren't really trying to really pull them as much as they should and i see that really in my school also i say it's very rare to find teachers that really care about their students like when you walk into a building like you can feel someone's energy and their aura and like i feel like someone like miss miles like it's very hard to find in the education system and it's like i feel like that's that's kind of odd because it's just like the same way that um, kids are needing to be coming to school motivated, the teachers do the same so that mm -hmm. they can pour into their students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ms. Ms. Hardy, do you want to weigh in on, on that piece, like why students check out and, and, and how we can address that? Yes. Um, I mean, we're human just like teachers are human and teachers may check out as well. But you know, things going on at home, um, things going on in the family. Um, and it comes into many things of why a student may check out. They may be stressed. They need to, may be depressed. But I feel as though ways at school or your teachers could help you or staff members, it don't always have to be a teacher. Um, they could connect with you. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that's an issue with multiple teachers as well. Like, you walk in a class, why are you late to my class? Blah, 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 blah. Like, teachers should just try to connect with their students, and you don't see that a lot. And me personally, I'm not one of Miss Miles's students. Mm. Um, Naela and I, Nora, are in her class. I'm not in her class. Mm. So I was introduced by her. I was introduced to her with our junior class or whatever we was sales max and her vibe and her aura and when you walk in her classroom you just feel like different like it don't mm. feel how we feel in the hallway and i really love that about her and i really appreciate her mm. um but yes i feel as though a solution to that could be just teachers checking up on their students try to connect with them try to have a conversation with them you know like you could it could be so many things that may be going on with your students and teachers just don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, you never know. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. We have to get ready to take a break, but I wonder if, if all three of you might not mind sharing a little about, about your aspirations. So, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Davis, Ms. Hardy, can you talk to us a little bit about, like, what you want to do going forward you know i'm assuming you're all going to college or university and you're already thinking about what the future uh holds for you um talk a little bit about about how you see your own futures and if we can start with miss davis that would be great okay i want to be a therapist i want to go to college and work with psychologists so because I understand from like my perspective because I went through depression during freshman and sophomore year mm -hmm. so that was really hard for me and I feel like if other people could get that off their chest and uh, like let people understand how they're feeling maybe it can become better because also with schools the school like stress it's it's really it's hard to make it through high school and also college because a lot of people suffer from depression because all of that built up stress that they have going on. So that's where I really want to go. I really want to help people, you know, 
express their feelings and know that it's not only them. Like, it's really other people out here going through the same. So you don't have to shut down or feel like you're in a hole by yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Miss Hughes, you want to talk about what the future Miss Hughes is going to be doing? Um, I would like to go to HBCU for African American Studies. All right. Um, well, we, 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 clap for all black we clap for all black studies majors, okay? We clap for all African American Studies majors, but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just speaking to Ms. Miles about building a foundation for my family. Like, mm. I was just speaking to this, speaking about this with my fellow friends, to mine and all, about, like, people getting too comfortable in the situations that they're in now, like, in society, or, like, in families and law, I feel like they've gotten too comfortable with, like, the bare minimum. Like, I want to set a bar. Like, I want to be able to set a foundation for my family where, like, we have our own. Like, for a black person, a black woman to be independent and have their own mean mm -hmm. and have everything to herself, like, that's something different. Like, when I get older, I want to be able to have my own land. Like, the bank, they're able to take anything and everything from me if they really want to. Like, I want to be able to have my own land build my own house and, like, build a foundation so that my mom has whatever and, like, I build a future for um, my family behind me also. Like, I feel like that's very important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Miss Hardy? Yes, my love. Yes. Um, but for me, I have so many career paths that I just want to take. But as far as my future in college, um, I think – I would fit best in law, like as a lawyer, as a judge. <laughs> All right. I don't know, but there's so many things I have that I've been thinking about my future. Um, I'm a, I also want to get into real estate. Mm -hmm. Also, um, there's so many career paths I do here. Like, it's just so many things. My mind is just everywhere. But the main factor is just to be successful and just to live and. Yes. Mm -hmm. Smart girl things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we got to get ready to to go to a break here. We This is Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are having an extraordinary conversation uh, with Miss Imani Miles, who's a social studies teacher at American History High School in Newark, New Jersey, along with several of her students, uh, Miss Nyla Hughes, who will be an executive director of a foundation in the future, Miss Inara Davis, or I should say future Dr. Inara Davis, who will be a psychologist and therapist, and judge Tamaya Hardy. Uh, I'm claiming all of that for all of y'all right now. You're listening to Evening Words. We'll be back after this break. Time for a traffic update on Word Radio. We're keeping tabs on a serious crash in Glen Mills. Route 1 southbound shut down between Schoolhouse Lane and Cheney Road. Broken down vehicle on 95 southbound in Woodhaven Road. It's in the right lane. Heavy delays back to Street Road. More delays further southbound in Delco on 95. Uh, Ridley Park out to the Commodore Barry Bridge. Schoolgirl Expressway eastbound. The off ramp to 202 and 422. We hear lots of potholes on that ramp. Big potholes. See some caution there. Schoolgirl eastbound jams. Blue Route to Belmont. And westbound where heavy University Avenue to the Vine Expressway and City Avenue to Belmont Avenue. Vine Expressway heavy westbound 95 to Broad Street. Report is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Looking for a career you'll love with flexibility, great pay and benefits, and one of the country's top workplaces? Join the growing team at Progressive Insurance. Go to Progressive.com slash careers and apply online today. And for more traffic information, log on to SigAlert.com. I'm Jason Lee with your Philadelphia area traffic. Want to be heard on Word? Yeah, this is Mystery A.K. I'm a Philadelphia. Dial 215-634-8065 to join the conversation. Outside of Philly, dial 1-866-361-0900. First time caller? Great. We would love to hear from you. Word is the voice of the African American community. So make yours heard. Please limit calls to once per day. Spread the word and tell a friend to tune in and join the conversation. Not all people are the same. And yet, when we visit the doctor, our treatments don't look that different. Why is that? Because we just don't have enough information to do it better. By gathering health data from one million people, 
Our country's best researchers will be able to develop treatments that are as unique and complex as we are. With this new information, doctors will have a better understanding of disease so they can innovate the next great breakthroughs in medicine. Learn more at joinallofus.org. Tune in to Eco Word Magazine, hosted by POC, the first Friday at 11 a.m. for the PA Lottery Eco Word Tip of the Day. Brought to you by PA Lottery, benefiting older Pennsylvanians every day. WURD is celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his own words. Somebody's asking how long will prejudice blind the visions of men. I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed the earth will rise again. Yeah. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it's in short justice. Yes, sir. How long? Not, not long. Not long. Because my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the village yes, by the grapes of wrath of sword. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, hallelujah. This Martin Luther King Jr. vignette was brought to you by Temple University, Independence Blue Cross, DDAP Get Help Now, Philadelphia Gasworks, and PHMC. Don't forget to join Word Radio this Monday, January 15th, as we continue to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And now, back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media. Welcome back to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We're live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. Before I introduce my next guest, who I'm really excited to talk to, I want to thank Miss Imani Miles, who's social studies teacher at American History High School in Newark, New Jersey, and her extraordinary students, Nyla Hughes, Inara Davis, and Samaya Hardy, who shared with us uh, about the founding of their own Black Student Union and the different challenges that young people are contending with in their day to day. I hope that was as eye opening for you all as it was for me. But my next guest is right here in Philadelphia, uh, Mr. Jamal Johnson from Stop Killing Us, the Stop Killing Us organizer and co creator of Operation Hug the Block. Uh, Brother Johnson, welcome to Evening Words. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine, sir. Brother Johnson, I, first of all, you know, when we were trying to dial this up for, for today's program, your name was the first one that came to mind for me in terms of thinking about the folks who are on the ground doing the real kind of activist work uh, that I think directly honors the direct action uh, uh, and the direct active legacy of the civil rights movement. So I, I appreciate all the work that you've been doing good, brother. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm well. So uh, obviously your your hunger strike was covered uh, by, 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 by the media, and, and we have a new administration coming in, in, into play and into place here in the city of Philadelphia. Can you, can you give us a sense of, of, of where you are in terms of your activism around, around gun violence in the city of Philadelphia right now? Well, as of uh, November 6th, uh, when we had the last day of the 77 night Operation Hug the Block, mm -hmm. I had since retired from doing work on the ground. Mm -hmm. Right now, what I'm trying to do is support others and to somehow get my message to the administration, the new administration, that we need to hit the ground running and that we need to still address this crisis that's affecting our communities. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. So okay, let's talk a little bit about about how how you how you're going to do those. And I, and I love the first piece, which is, I mean, obviously you put your body and your life on the line uh, for this particular issue and for and for the movement. But the pivot to 
to to training and facilitating and bringing other folks in is important because obviously we we want we want your work to have that that impact and in, in as broad and as wide as, as as possible. Can you share with us what that transition entails? Are you are you recruiting folks? Are you engaging young people around these issues? Talk a little bit about how you're uh, expanding your impact based upon your already um, um, really powerful activism around these issues. Well, actually, I'm trying to do both. Uh, there were some young people I had met through the years mm -hmm. that I see now that are really doing some good work out there. Then there are others who have said that they would like to somewhat uh, pick up where I left off, which, mm -hmm. as you know, is probably unorthodox in a lot of things that I do. And I haven't really seen that yet, but I'm encouraged by the fact that they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that I'm trying to hope that we can close a gap generationally as it uh, comes to what they perceive activism as compared to what I perceive activism as. Because mm. I do believe that one is going to be more advantageous than the other. One is noise, other one is getting something done. And I'm hoping that we get a lot more done in this administration's time than we have in the previous ones. So, Brother Johnson, am I, am I sensing a note of optimism about the potential for this administration to address these issues, the gun violence issues, the community issues um, um, uh, going forward? And I don't want to, I'm not trying to box you in, bro. I just, I just asked, am I, am I hearing some optimism in your voice about, about this new administration around the issues that you care about and the issues you literally have put your life on line for? I'm optimistic about those who say that they want to do more about what's going on in this city, but I'm not optimist, uh, optimistic if the administration doesn't include those people in what they say are their efforts to curtail this problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, now, Brother Johnson, I, I obviously I, I, I've been following your work for some time and and, you know, know about the hunger strike. But there may be some of our listeners who just don't know that work and don't know, you know, kind of what you did. Can you kind of describe the process around that and 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 the goal of that and, and, and what you did to put pressure on the previous administration around this particular issue? Well, back in uh, 2020, I believe, City Council came up with a resolution 200447 asking Mayor Kenny to address gun violence in Philadelphia, and they outlined specific items they would want him to address. Mm -hmm. He publicly stated he was not going to address not only the resolution, but the items that they put out there. He said he was doing all he could, and that was it. This went on for about six or seven months, at which time I felt that it was totally disrespectful to city council who represents us to let him say he would not acknowledge something they, he, they put out there mm -hmm. to address gun violence. Mm -hmm. As a result, I took it upon myself to undergo a hunger strike to, for lack of a better word, force the mayor to not only acknowledge the resolution, but also say what he would do. Mm. I needed to say this went on for about 26 days mm. Mm. until mm. at which time uh, he uh, came to speak to me accompanied by um, a local uh, person, uh, Serge, uh, Serge Blackwell, mm -hmm. purple, purple lady. And, and, you know, he, they came and we spoke and he did publicly announce that he acknowledges the resolution and he did say he would do what he could. Following that, he did start a uh, bi-weekly announcement about statistics on gun violence in Philadelphia, which is something I had asked. Mm -hmm. But he really didn't go too much further than that. Um, I must also say that when I wasn't at City Hall protesting outside in the snow, the rain, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. I was outside of his residence. <laughs> and the reason being because I wanted to be insistent and persistent. Mm -hmm. And this is what I mean when I talk about activism. I wanted him to realize that I was not going to allow him to be comfortable as as our people, especially our children, were dying on our streets. Mm -hmm. can, can you talk a little bit more about, about the value of direct action in our community? I'm not sure if everybody understands and, uh, and appreciates like just the value of direct action in terms of of advancing issues and challenges that are impacting our community day in and day out? 
Well, I believe direct action. A lot of people think that because you make noise, that's what it is, noise. Mm -hmm. They also think that just because they don't immediately see the results, you haven't accomplished anything. Mm. I have found out during different type of protests, uh, including the protests against gun violence, that noise gets attention and doing things the way you have done will get you the same results that you had before. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we should have learned from George Floyd, what we should learn even now from the Gaza protests, uh, that when you make noise, people will recognize. Mm -hmm. And they will try to do what they can to quell that noise, legally or illegally. But you can't expect people to respect your pain when you're not willing to show them that it hurts. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I think direct action does. Mm, that's that, that's powerful stuff. I, I, I'm i curious as I mean, obviously, and I don't want to disparage or discourage any young people, but a lot of young people, you know, think that they're, you know, they're, they're conducting their activism on social media. Now, clearly, you also use social media as one of the tools in your in your toolkit. Uh, for, for, for for activism, but can you help folks kind of understand what role you think social media should and can play in the kind of activism that you're leading and directing? Well, that's another uh, issue that I think people are misled about when it comes to social media and media in general. Mm -hmm. People say, well, you know, you just want to be on TV or you just want to get likes. It's not about that. We need to inform people. You can't expect people to join something they don't know about. Mm -hmm. And you surely can't expect people to care about something that they don't realize is as severe as it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the problems that we're having in this city is that people are thinking that, well, as long as you do things the normal way, you'll get the normal response and eventually your problem will be solved. That has not been proven to be the case in most of the problems that we've had. If, if it were, we wouldn't have the legislative battles we have in City Hall. The thing is that we have to take it a step forward, and we have to prove that we are seriously about what we claim we're about. There's no way we can have 400, 500 homicides in this city, and no one makes a noise above a whimper. Mm. You have got to let these people feel your pain. Even the people who have lost people, those people want you to feel their pain. That's why they carry signs with their loved ones on it. Mm. Well, those of us who, don't, who have been fortunate not to have that issue where we're carrying signs around like that, we have to still support them in other ways that show that we are not going to do things a regular way because this is not a regular problem. Mm -hmm. This is a crisis, and that's why we're making the noise we make. We must be seen, we must be heard, and others must see us, and others must hear us. Mm. Brother Johnson, can you, can you talk a little bit about Operation Hug the Block and kind of where 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 we are with that right now? I know that... You know, there was months long protests and efforts uh, to, to end gun violence. But I also know it's more comprehensive than that. Can you share with our audience what the goals are and, and, and the updates for, 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 for Hug the Block? Yes. A few months back, um, well, let me say this. Prior to Hug the Block, I had been advocating for patrols of our community. Mm -hmm. And I had been asking that we pay people to patrol their own community. That's right. Not police I, patrols, not police patrols, but community no. patrols. Right. Community patrols. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People that live in their neighborhood, walk around their neighborhood, sit on their steps, be the eyes and ears of their community and get paid for it. Mm -hmm. This is what I believe is needed. And this is what I've taken the members of city council about. Well, I've also taken it to the community and tried to do it myself a few times and actually join other people in doing it. Mm -hmm. But then a organization which I admire and respect ha had been doing things on the ground, including that, has been Philly Truce. Mm -hmm. So Philly Truce reached out to me one day and said, you know, we have this list of 77 of the worst neighborhoods in Philly. And we're thinking about doing patrols. Are you ready for that? I'm the most definitely. So we collaborated and decided we would go to each block, uh, one one block at a time. There were 77 at that time. Mm -hmm. There were more now. But that meant that those blocks had five or more shootings since 2015. Wow. Okay, so we said, okay, we will go to each one of those blocks over the next 77 nights from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. And we would patrol that community. But prior to us actually patrolling or while patrolling, we would also speak to the community. 
to try to engage the community mm -hmm. and try to encourage them to do this after we leave because we need community involvement. Mm -hmm. This is something I have jumped up and down about. We have to have community engagement and community involvement. We do not have it. Mm. There is no proof that we have the level of community engagement that we need. So we did this for 77 nights. Also, we have put out to city council that they adopt this as a model to continue on because we ended on November the 6th, mm -hmm. day before election, and we ended with the hopes that the new administration would acknowledge it and possibly adopt it. Well, they never acknowledged it, to my, to my knowledge at least, mm -hmm. during the time we were out there. Nobody from the present administration ever came out and, you know, asked us about it, came out with us or anything to that effect. But I'm still hoping that Philly Troops, who now is spearheading that effort, mm -hmm. will get the support they need from the city. Yeah, that that that's in incredible. I have to get ready to go to break, Brother Johnson. But I hope you'll you'll hold on, and maybe we can take a couple calls on the other side. I, you know, there a lot of folks have been asking like why or how the 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 numbers have gone down this year, and I've tried to explain to to those folks that it's it's not policing, and really even at this point, it's not policy. What it is is it's activists and organizations. It's it's hug the block. It's, it's really true. I mean, we have seen some movement in the right direction around some of these trends, and people kind of wonder, like, how, how it's happening. But I, when we come back from break, I want you to talk a little bit more about that, about sometimes the work may appear to be invisible on the stat sheets, but that doesn't mean it's not impactful. You're listening to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are in conversation with Jamal Johnson. We're live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. If you want to join this conversation, if you have a question for Brother Johnson, please give us a call, 215-634-8065. That's 215-634-8065. We'll be back after these messages. WURD is celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his own words. Somebody's asking how long will prejudice blind the visions of men. I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed the earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it tends towards justice. Yes, sir. How long? Not, not long. Not long. Because my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the biggest yes, by the grapes of wrath of the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, sir. His truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Lisa, Lisa. He is lifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, hallelujah. This Martin Luther King Jr. vignette was brought to you by Temple University, Independence Blue Cross, DDAP Get Help Now, Philadelphia Gasworks, and PHMC. Don't forget to join Word Radio this Monday, January 15th, as we continue to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The Philadelphia Orchestra, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, featuring the great jazz pianist Marcus Roberts and his trio. This American classic soars and swings, blending jazz and blues with classical, making it an audience favorite for generations. Three performances, January 18th through 20th. Tickets and information at philorc.org. Have you ever walked a dog without a diaper? or been so hungry you ate more than three sandwiches? In the wrong state, that could make you a criminal. There are ridiculous laws on the books everywhere, like laws that criminalize HIV. These HIV laws are out of touch with science and our society. They ruin lives by perpetuating stigma and racism. And they're on the books in over 30 states, maybe even here. It's time to repeal these ridiculous laws. Take action at healthnotprisons.org. Where's the professor? And now back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media.
Welcome back to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. I am in in conversation with Brother Jamal Johnson from Stop Killing Us and co-creator of Operation Hug the Block. If you want to join the conversation, please give us a call, 215-634-8065. That's 215-634-8065. Brother Johnson, welcome back to the program. I I was going on a little bit of a rant before we went to break. But I and I know you're not gonna, you know, you, you're not gonna take credit for for different things. But but can you talk a little bit about the impact of your work over the last couple of years? I would I would like to hope that what I've done has been impactful. Uh, some of the, uh, the things I have done also is the yearly march to D.C. to the Congressional Black Caucus, mm-hmm. and that was from Philly to D.C. And the reason I walked there was to impress also upon them how much we were concerned about the gun violence happening not only in our city but across this country, mm-hmm. in addition to the lack of effort that we feel that they're doing in reference to the George Floyd bill. Uh, another thing is that I took a walk to Governor Wolf's home up in Mount Wolf, Pennsylvania from Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and I did that because I wanted the governor to realize that Mayor Kenny was not doing all he could. And the governor and I had a conversation about it. And, you know, he basically said he couldn't do much without Mayor Kenny's uh, support, which is okay. It is what it is. The, the thing I'm trying to say is this. We can have an impact. And we can do something about gun violence in this city. But we must think outside the box about that and anything else that we really want to change in this city. And, and, and just to clarify for our listeners, you know, th- thinking outside the box for you, it's, it's, it's so compelling, Brother Johnson, because, you know, you're not, you know, you're not talking about like, oh, go out and vote or you know, you, you're talking about like community engagement and community action, like community members walking the block. How do we, you know, because we have a lot of callers who call in and we're going to take a call in a minute here, but we have a lot of callers who call in who are frustrated. But it sounds to me like you're saying is some of this work is work we have to do as community members. Exactly. And they have every right to be frustrated if they have done anything. Mm -hmm. If they haven't done anything, what are you frustrated about? (laughs) I mean, you you have to be a part of the solution, you know, or you're part of the problem. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. And everybody can do something, even if it's bugging your elected officials or bugging your nonprofits that you see on TV that are talking about all this stuff they do in your neighborhood and you don't see it. Mm-hmm. Well, then you need to start asking them where you're at because I don't see you. These are things you can do. Other than that, you're just part of the problem. Mm. Mm. Our brother Johnson, you know, we had some, we had some young folks on right, right before you talk a little bit about how, how you see youth activism uh, in the city of Philadelphia. I think youth activism is very, very necessary. And I think, unfortunately, they're not getting the credit or the exposure as they need because they are the ones, unfortunately, who are suffering from this the most as far as the lives that are dying out here. Mm-hmm. And if anyone has a stake in this, it's them. Unfortunately, we see a lot of older people like myself mm-hmm. who are being seen doing so many things and the younger people, for whatever reason, aren't getting that spotlight that they should have. Mm-hmm. I think if we can somehow close the gap, start collaborating more, start realizing we both don't see things the same way, but we can come to a common ground, I think we can get things done. And I think it will increase the numbers, which will cause us to get more respect from our elected officials and those we need support from. Mm, mm. Obviously, it's, it's MLK Day. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the legacy of Dr. King within the context of your incredible work here in the city of Philadelphia and abroad. Yes, well, I started my hunger strike and I started to march to Governor Wolf's house on Martin Luther King Day of those two years. Mm -hmm. And I did that because I do think that it's significant that, and I don't mean any offense to anyone, but I do think we have to do more than just pick up trash and paint walls. I mean, Mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is people are dying. This is death, life and death for us. Now, other people who may support us from other communities may not feel our pain, but we feel it, and we got to prove it. And to me, Martin Luther King was an example of doing that with the sacrifices he made with himself and his body, his family. So I can't say anything less than doing that for myself if I truly want to follow his example and, of course, his ideals. Mm. 
Mm, thank you for that. We're going to go to the phone lines. I'm going to welcome Brother George from Center City. Brother George, do you have a comment or question for Jamal Johnson? How you doing, Brother Peace? How you doing, Todd? Listen, I, I'm doing well. I want to uh, congratulate you on your first date, but you get a pass on your first date. Trust me, you do. You get a pass, you know, because <laughs> uh, let me say it like this here. You are the finally start listening to management of their customers, you know, and that's why you are there because they got, I mean, they got letters, they got calls, everything. You know, they just got, people got fed up and they lost their base. They lost their customers, you know. So today you get a pass, you know, because, I mean, you'll probably get catch hell when you get off the air, you know, but. Brother that, George, let me, let me, I, let me, go ahead. I, 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 do you have a question for Brother Johnson? We are right in the middle of a great conversation with Jamal Johnson. It, you're right. It's really a statement because. What Brother Johnson is doing, what he does personally and what he's done on his time is great. But people not in the streets like they used to because these kids today shoot, okay? And they be shooting people for the fun of it. It ain't like they're going around, they got to pee for somebody. Nobody's risking their life. The police ain't even doing nothing, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. How many times you've been in a block where they're selling guns at? Where their house is actually set up as a, as a, like a store, to like sell that, guns. Set up there, I can tell you not one time. You know why? Because they don't allow the, the neighbors, the community there won't even allow you in the block unless you're going in there to buy a gun because it's just too much involved. You know, it sounds good to say, oh, the people should do this, but nobody's going to risk their life. Okay. It's right. just plain and simple as that. And Kenny, at least Kenny man enough to tell you he ain't going to give you nothing and he don't care and he ain't doing it. And all this here, everybody think all this is going to change and do all that there? Unless the police do their job and the rest of them do their job, this, this, we're already up to what, 17 deaths already? I 17, think 18 deaths already? Last check, yes. Right. Yes. I mean, you know, it, it's just, it sounds good, and he's doing a good job of whatever he's doing. But look at the reality and face the facts that you have administration is stuck on Kensington, which they can't do nothing about unless they just move it to West Philadelphia, which they're planning on doing. But they're in chaos now because the elected officials know that's the plan, move it to West brother Philadelphia. Brother George, Brother George, let me save a All couple right. minutes for Brother Johnson to respond. Thank you for the call, Brother. I appreciate it. Brother Johnson, That you know, Brother George is, doesn't represent everybody, but but you, you hear some of the frustration in his voice. I do. And I will say this to Brother George and any other black man in this city. We are the problem if we're not the solution. Mm. If we're scared of our own kids to mm. the point where we're not willing to protect our other kids, then we're the problem. Mm. I mean, I'm no Superman any more than any other man in this world. But my fear of my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren being shot is greater than the fear of me being shot. Mm. So we've got to have people out there. We've got to have people who are willing, and we will we say a saying all the time while we walk the streets. We're looking for men, able and willing, to get on the ground and stop this killing. Now, if you're not willing to do that, then I don't understand where your frustration comes from. Because the truth of the matter is, you can do something. You can become part of the solution. We're here to support one another. Mm. Sure, we can't guarantee nobody will be hurt, shot, stabbed. We were threatened while we were out there. But the bottom line is, what is the alternative? Our women, our children, our elderly are being prey out here to whoever, whatever, whenever. So, I mean, all we're trying to do is be a deterrent. We don't claim to be police. We just want to hopefully give them a reason to think twice. Mm. Thank you for that, Brother Johns. Listen, I, I would like to extend to you an open invitation to join me here on Evening Words whenever and however time permits to talk about the work that you're doing to inspire us with the work and the models you're showing. And, and listen, I don't want to, I, I, you know, I'm going to be a bad guy with some of these calls anyway, but I'm telling you, we spend a lot of time complaining about some things. And sometimes it's really great to talk to somebody who's doing something about those things. And I think we need to hear more from you, good brother, in order to, to change that dynamic in terms of how we wrestle with, with some of these issues. There wasn't really a question in it. That was just a comment. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was just that was just a comment. Listen, I have to. I got to get ready to go to break, and I I, I got to let you go. But but brother Johnson, thank you so much. It is this is my debut as the host of of Evening Words, and it's it's an honor to 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 have you on. And I I love you for the work that you do, and for what you represent in terms of community empowerment and community engagement around one of the toughest uh, issues here in the city of Philadelphia. And my hope is is that that you'll come back and join me on air sometime soon. Anytime. Thank you, good brother. You all have been listening to Brother Jamal Johnson from Stop Killing Us, one of the Stop Killing Us organizers and co-creative operation Hug the Block. He's about it, folks. He's about what he's talking about. This brother is hes talking about the problems, but he's also about how do we address and, and, and work through some of the challenges in real time. And he literally puts his life on the line for some of the issues that we just talked about. So, Brother Johnson, thank you much, so much for joining us here on Evening Words. You're listening to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. When we come back from this break, I got another roundtable that I can't wait to introduce you all to. We'll be back after these messages. It's the WRD Hot 60. Hot 60. Here's the hottest 60 seconds you missed this week on Love and Life. Dr. Gooden, you made a comment about learned behavior, and I'm curious to know, how is it that we gravitate to learned behavior or, or we, we follow learned behavior more than listening to discernment? That's a good question. I believe the best answer is to say that learned behavior is learned because it's seen so frequently and it's mm-hmm. repeated, the behaviors that are observed. But stop and ask yourself, were there things you saw at home or you experienced that you said, I'm never going to do that. And then you found yourself doing it too. When I was being raised, my parents whipped me. But it comes from slavery experiences where if we didn't beat our children and beat them severely, the enslaver was very likely going to kill your child. We've got to learn to let go of being slaves or enslaved people. You know, Harriet Tubman said she could have freed a lot more people had they just known that they were enslaved. And that's your hottest 60 seconds this week from Love and Life on WURD Progressive Black Talk Media. For more than a decade, Comcast has been committed to bridging the digital divide in Philadelphia and across the country. From connecting people to the internet to opening doors for the next generation of innovators, entrepreneurs, and storytellers, they are helping to create a future that benefits generations to come. Now, Comcast is expanding their efforts through Project Up, their comprehensive initiative to help build a future of unlimited possibilities. Backed by a $1 billion commitment to reach tens of millions of people over the next decade, Comcast is working to ensure all Philadelphians have the skills, resources, resources, and opportunities they need to participate and excel in an increasingly digital world. This includes partnering with community experts to build a network of digital navigators, trusted individuals who help build awareness around initiatives like the government's Affordable Connectivity Program, and teach critical digital skills to get more people online. Project Up, building a future of unlimited possibilities. Learn more at Comcast.com slash Project Up. Through Project Up, Comcast is committing $1 billion to build a future of unlimited possibilities. Science is not an opinion. People come before pipelines. It's not too late to act on climate. At Earth Justice, we hold these beliefs to be self-evident. We're a national legal nonprofit fighting for your right to a healthy environment. Our 150 plus lawyers represent clients free of charge because now more than ever, the Earth needs a good lawyer. If you believe what we believe, go to earthjustice.org today. I'm Carol Riddick, the host of Love and Life. And guess what, family? I will be live. That's right. I can speak with you about the real facts and honest opinions on dating, sexual health, casual and committed relationships. Join me Monday through Thursday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. The conversations will be served on a judgment-free platter and seasoned with unapologetic realness. So join me Monday through Thursday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media. It isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. And when you do this, when you do this, you've mastered the length of life. 
Celebrating black excellence worldwide and bringing joy and power to the people. This is WURD, 900 AM and 96.1 FM, Philadelphia. Streaming online on wordradio.com and the Word Radio app. Where's the professor? And now back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media. Welcome back to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WURD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. I am honored uh, to bring into the program this evening a WURD brain trust uh, first and foremost, we have Joanne Bell, who's the co-host of Black Women's Leadership Council on Fridays right here on WRD from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We got the great Kayla J, host of Sunday Morning Praise, Sundays 6 to 11 a.m. And, of course, Brother Shamari, host of Groundings on Friday from 1 to 4 p.m. And the ARC on Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m. all here on WRD. A little bit later, I'm sure we'll be joined by Michael Cord from Radio Courtroom. We'll admit that brother into the Zoom room as soon as possible. I just want to welcome you all to the program. Y'all, y'all know I'm very, very excited to be here today uh, with the official announcement and all that, but also really excited to be in conversation with you all um, around around MLK, Dr. King's legacy, and why we're all here celebrating and and and, and engaging around it. And I think I, I w- I'd like to start with you, Joanne, if you don't mind. Can you? No problem. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Can you share with us a little bit about what you've been thinking about over the course of the day, and 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 kind of what today's meaning is for you? And I I want I want answers from all of you on this, but I'm just I'm just starting with with, with Joanne, who's the co-host again of Black Women's Leadership Council on Fridays on WRD from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Miss Bell, MLK Day. Oh, it's 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 extremely important because I've lived through most of this stuff, and I can vividly recall the day that he was murdered and where I was. I was um, in New York City with my mother and sister, looking up at that the 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 board that was going around, and they said that he had been shot. Hmm. And my mother said, "Well, it's time to rush us home." Um, because we knew that there was going to be trouble, and we got out of Manhattan as quickly as we could. I lived in New York City, and I lived in Queens at the time. Mm. Um, several years ago, we started uh, we we started Black Women's Leadership Council. We we started it in the late '90s, but then we picked um, back up because we called it the Fierce urgency of now that was in 2016 we called all of the women back together again because we understood that we were on the precipice of losing all of the things that we had gained under dr king and all of the courageous people who stood with him and before him and so we felt that uh, we needed to come back together as women and to fight for our community and i do think that um and i say this often on our program um we are in trouble mm. and we're and we're experiencing the resistance that history has shown us that we have had before and we are going through another period for which we take 10 steps forward and 15 backwards mm. and if we don't fight for this thing for us you know we're going to fight for democracy but we got to fight for the survival of 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 african americans in this country Mm. And for a lot of us who have uh, had all of the benefits of the civil rights movement, I'm a child who has had the benefits Mm -hmm. as a result, was able to go to college as a result of it, um, able to have jobs where uh, we would not have been 10 years before that. And now all of those things are threatened for our children and and for me, for my children and grandchildren. Mm. Mm, thank you so much for that, Ms. Bell. Brother Shamari, talk a little about what you're reflecting on on, on this MLK Day. Um, well, I think I, I'm a Morehouse man. So, <laughs> you know, and I, ha- I happen to be, my freshman year at Morehouse was this 1983-84 was my freshman year, which was the same year that Ronald Reagan signed the legislation to, for the holidays commemoration. Mm. So I don't, you know, anybody who's gone to Morehouse can tell you we get indoctrinated. It's just part of the education is our first year, you know, we get indoctrinated about Dr. King mm-hmm. and Benjamin Elijah Mays. And so 
you know, that, that, that move to be able to sit at the feet of uh, people who were still alive at the time I was there, uh, Joseph Lowry, um, Andrew Young, mm-hmm. um, many others. Uh, you know, some names I, I, I don't like calling because my the story that I'm told about them is very different than the story we celebrate now, right? So mm-hmm. when I say that, I think about somebody like John Lewis, right? But all of that is in the milieu of Atlanta when I went to school because, of course, with that first year of the holiday celebration, we're indoctrinated. Um, and, and I mean the word literally, we were indoctrinated <laughs> about the I have a dream Dr. King, not the evolving Dr. King. Got it. And I think that, you know, that 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 integration is America is the great and we, we just got to make America great again. Dr. King is very different than I think. I believe in the Dr. King of the later 60s, 66, 67, 68. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we get a chance to explore that a, a little bit because I think that our storytelling has been co-opted about both Dr. King, but also more importantly, the civil rights movement. It's, mm. been, it's been made in a historical. The civil rights movement has been taken outside of the larger context of the Pan-African and global rights movements that were going on at the same time. And that were in many ways very interconnected. And I think that when we talk about the civil rights movement, we become very myopic and insular and thinking that it was just a movement for black people in America. And more importantly, that it was just a southern black people's movement. And it was way bigger than that. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Kayla J. I know you've been busy in and out of the station here today, but but talk a little bit about what you've been reflecting on this, this MLK day. So a lot of times we just say Dr. Martin Luther King, right? And sometimes we forget that he's Reverend Dr. Mm. Martin Luther King. Come on, so pre- as a come member on, of preacher. the clergy, <laughs> you know, I think about what uh, he his religious stance and what he stood for and how he used his platform in the church uh, for social justice, for mm. civil rights. Um, and, I, and that's what I've really been reflecting on throughout the day of just how he used his uh, charismatic preaching to not persuade people, but to share the message of what is right. Mm. Yes, he was a great civil rights leader. Yes, he was an educated man. Uh, however, he also had this call to people. And, and I feel like sometimes we just forget that. We get caught up in his speeches and, and, and how uh, he, he traveled the world, you know, changing lives. But we forget that he started this whole world because he was called to the people mm. because he's Reverend Dr. King. Mm, mm. Thank you uh, for, for that, Kayla. I want to come back to you, Miss Bell. I mean, I'm curious, you know, there are so many issues. We just got we just got off with Jamal Johnson, who's been doing yeoman's work here in the city of Philadelphia around uh, f- fighting back from a community engagement perspective with respect to gun violence. That's his issue. I wonder, this is for all of you, but I want to start with Ms. Bell. Talk to us a little bit about, like, what still needs to be done in terms of the work that you're doing in your lane? What are, What's the top two or three issues for the work that you're doing in your lane when it comes to the legacy of Dr. King? Well, I think that Dr. King started with um, attempting to have equal rights and uh, what we call civil rights. And I want civil, you know, I want dollar rights. Mm. And um, and so I have, there are lots of things I could do in my, commu- in, in my career and face it, I'm at the end of it, not the beginning of it, not the middle of it. And so there are things that I can say and do that I, have fe- I don't have the fear of repercussions because frankly, I don't care. <laughs> and so um, what I do, when every table that I sit at, I make sure that that table is representative and that we are talking about a fair a fair distribution of goods and services and that we have uh, that we can grow black businesses because we need to have our financial independence and that is the thing that 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 keeps us from uh, stabilizing our communities and so whether I support uh, the governor which I did and the new mayor which I did but it was with the understanding that we will be at that table and when and and we will take part in all of the largesse Mm -hmm. that that will that will come out from government because things flow from from government Mm -hmm. and and i don't always want the conversation to be how we you know that that the black community is poor and so we need to just raise the minimum wage or the black community lacks education mm-hmm. so that we should just have um 
the charter schools. I want to have a menu that has all of that on it and to understand that we are owed something as a result of the pain that we have had from the days of slavery and the Jim Crow, the redlining and all of the other stuff. And now it's time mm -hmm. to be able to sit at that table and to be able to get the things that all of us want in terms of stabilizing our community. Mm. Thank you. For and that. our families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Brother Samar, I want you to ask the same question. Like, what still needs to be done in terms of how you see, like, what your lane is? But first, can you share with our audience a little bit more about, you know, you started to talk a little bit about the sanitization of the civil rights movement, the decontextualization of MLK's later years. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that and then give us your top couple of issues, please? Well, those, those are big questions. I um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just think I, I think that we okay. So let me stick with number number one. When we talk about the civil rights movement, or we talk about the 1960s, we tend to focus on our story as quote unquote Black Americans, mm -hmm. and we don't link the story to the larger global movements against capitalism, against racism and oppression, against war and militarism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, those things, those things should be familiar from Dr. King's triple evil speeches, right? We, he railed against uh, militarism in the Vietnam War. Sure he railed did. against uh, capitalism and excessive greed, not just in the North American or American context, but as the global capitalist system, right? And he railed against racism, not just in this American form, but ag against it in its global form. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are the three things, man. I think that those are still the three things, right? It, you know, to answer your question, mm -hmm. those are still the three things. Those are the areas where we as a human family of African descent need to still in this day figure out as he and, 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 and you know, the great Malcolm X were trying to figure out mm -hmm. how do we link these struggles. You, you can look at the polarity and say, okay, Dr. King to me was avowed in his belief that the seed of our independence was rooted in a reclamation and a restoration of his thought of what American democracy and American equality meant. Mm -hmm. you know, his dream, he said, was deeply rooted in the American dream. And often he would call forward icons early on, like uh, Abraham Lincoln, like mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson, to ground his assertions around this push for equality and democracy. Later on, he began to question whether those are the icons that, that he needed to look at. And I remember one of his great uh, shorter speeches where he says, you know, we need to write for ourselves mm. a self-asserted declaration of independence of our manhood. It's going to take more than a Jeffersonian declaration more than a Lincoln. So he began to evolve and understand in a way that I think that we have yet to pick up the mantle where both he and and um, Malcolm X and what they represented in the 60s and what they were trying to link at this larger global level mm -hmm. to address militarism, racism, and excessive uh, capitalism, excessive uh, greed and things of that nature. Those are still the three things. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Thank you for that, brother Shamari. Uh, Kayla J. You know, from in terms of like your lane and the, and the great work that you do, um, you know, what what what's what's the work ahead from your perspective? So I'm just going to keep on this this like clergy kick, right? My That's show right. is Sunday That's right. Praise. He was Reverend Doctor. I'm not a Reverend Doctor, but I'm a Reverend. So, mm -hmm. uh, but work that we need to do is some work that is already being started, uh, which is putting more social justice work and making social justice social justice advocacy in the church normal. Mm -hmm. I've had the privilege uh, this past year, well, last year, of working with uh, different denominations across our great country of trying to do that. I think what Dr. King was doing was making, was Yes, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ of what he believes, but he was also applying it to the everyday people. Mm. Like sometimes I think we forget when we go to our places of worship that they're not just the usher, the the, the choir member, the church announcer. They they are a secretary at an executive company. They are a, a sanitation worker. They're a doctor. They're a lawyer. We are we are this and that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is why social justice advocacy needs to come to the church because when a, a shooting happens on my block, it's happening to me too. I'm traumatized too. Yes, I'm clergy, 
yes, I go to the church, but I'm also human. Mm. So I believe the work that still need to be done is just a lot of places of worship, not excluding what's happening out on the streets, but including it in conversation spaces and sermons and just making sure that the people that they are ministering to each and every week know that they have a safe place to come to. Yes, we know that churches get uh, bombed as well and get targeted and mosques get targeted, but at some point we have to know that we can bond together in that worship unit to fight against this injustice as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, We're, we're going to take a call if you don't mind. We're going to go to James uh, from North Philly. Brother James, welcome to Evening Words. You're on with uh, WRD Brain Trust here, Miss Joanne Bell, uh, Reverend Kayla J, and Brother Samari. Uh, are all hosts at WRD. Do you have a question or comment for this panel? Uh, first of all, excuse me, uh, happy birthday, Dr. King, mm -hmm. King family. I would like to say the people in my life most important is God. Mm -hmm. Creator, mm -hmm. my mother, my father, community. Dr. King was the first to determine public power. Dr. King had a vision. We all know. And I'd like to say, I got a lot more to say, but I don't have time. Mm -hmm. We have to come together. There's a war going on between God's children and the devil. And it ain't about color. Mm. I love y'all. Thank, thank, thank you, brother James. We we appreciate that call. Uh, uh, a fellow WRD host, any responses to uh, brother James's comment? I, you know, I, I so it, it is about love. It's a war going on, and I, I I think that you know one of the lessons learned. I think that we got to start from the fact that some of this is about color. A lot of this is about color. Color matters. Um, <laughs> this this idea that King was was invisible <clears throat> about color. Mm. Um, it's a big mythology. He definitely would be considered a race man by all of the definitions of what a race man is. I, I think that, you know, his political call was to a sense of America living up to the ideal that he's that they professed and that we're the most short was around color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you know, this idea that the struggle, I, I don't, I, I want somebody to name me a struggle that we as a collective group of black people are in across the globe that at its root don't have, have something to do with our color and who we are as a melanated people and our consciousness. Like, we got to stop running from the reality that there has been a global war, you can call it anti-blackness. I think that that's a great term for it. Mm -hmm. Across history, like at, like we gotta own that because our desire to act like that's not a thing is a thing. <laughs> it it definitely is, uh, brother Shamar. I think sometimes people feel like they're rising above it by 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 trying to you know distance themselves from it. But and no disrespect to that call, I don't think I don't think that call stands alone in that in that kind of framework. But it's just you know we, I, for me, it's very difficult to have a critical analysis of the world that we live in, uh, where we live in the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding parts, the moment that we're in the 21st century uh, without understanding the rampant anti-black racism that shapes, you know, the, the, the world that we live in. But Ms. Bell or, or, or Reverend Kayla Jay, do, do you all want to respond to that comment? I certainly do. And um, um, I agree with Brother Shamari. Uh, we, we kidded ourselves when we thought that we were in the post-racial <laughs> America when we elected uh, Barack Obama. Mm, say it again, please. And, say it again, please. <laughs> and, and, and we found out that very quickly the pushback started as soon as he was elected. And so therefore, and I, and, and I talk about how they went to dismantle 
the coalition piece by piece. Mm. They went after ACORN. They went after the unions. They went after the uh, uh, pre-clearance with the uh, Civil Rights Act, that right. uh, Voting Rights Act. That's right. They, they systematically went after every piece of that coalition. They went after students. We can't kid ourselves. We are not in a post-racial, and it's always about race, and we have to accept that. Um, it, as, as much as it may hurt some, that is what it's about. And when we look at what's going on globally around the world, there, there is a whole issue they call it about people immigrating, but it's who's immigrating. Mm. It's, it's the color of the people who are immigrating, whether they are coming across the Mexican border or whether they're in Europe, trying mm. to leaving Africa to go to Europe. It's all about immigration. It's all about color. And Palestine is about color, too. Mm, mm, mm. Kayla J., you want to weigh in on this piece? Um, I'm, as the youngest person here, I'm <laughs> going to say it took me a while to realize, uh, like Brother Shamari said, like like Miss Joanne said, that everything kind of really is rooted in your color and in your race. Because um, I, I personally didn't have my first experience with that until I went to college. And I, just was, I went to college in Virginia. So it was a, a big wake-up call. And I think a lot of people my age and younger than me, we're, we're seeing it more often. We're realizing it. I think, like Ms. Joanne said, we thought we was in a post-racial era. Everything was good. It looked like everything was turning turning up black, right? We, we had songs about it. Everything black. My president is black. Like, we, had, we, we, we felt it. We thought we had arrived. We moved on up like Jefferson's. Mm -hmm. But now we are we are just starting to wake up and realize I'm going to say with the help of social media, right, that the work, the work is not finished, is nowhere near finished. And we need to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. We got to take a quick break. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to come back for closing remarks. And I would love to hear all of I want to stay on this theme about kind of like how the backlash works and the rollbacks work and some of the things that that we have to think about as 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 we as we close out the segment you're listening to evening words i'm your host dr james peterson we're live on wrd 900 am 96.1 fm we are in deep conversation with miss joanne bell who's the co-host of black women's leadership council which airs on wrd on fridays from 11 a.m to 1 p.m with kayla J who's the host of Sunday Morning Praise on WRD on Sundays from 6 to 11 a.m., and Brother Shamari, host of Groundings on Friday from 1 to 4, and the Ark, excuse me, on Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m., all on WRD. We'll be back after these messages. Stand with Word Radio as we continue to provide dynamic, progressive programming to inform and empower our people. We're living in unprecedented times, and we must stand together to protect and preserve Black Talk Media. Become a Four Word member with the annual membership price of just $90, or a digital member starting at just $5 per month. If you're already a Four Word member, sign up, family member, or a friend to help us continue making history. Start or renew your forward membership today visit wordradio.com forward slash forward or wordradio.com forward slash membership light heat grants through pgw are available and one in three households in philadelphia are eligible to receive up to a one thousand dollar grant to pay for their natural gas heating bill this winter pgw has made it easier than ever to see if you're eligible and to apply simply text money to 77037 call 215-235-1000 or visit pgworks.com forward slash light heat pgw helping ease minds this winter WURD is celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his own words. I accept the Nobel Prize for Peace at a moment when 22 million Negroes of the United States are engaged in a creative battle to end the long night of racial injustice. I accept this award on behalf of a civil rights movement which is moving with determination. I am mindful that only yesterday in Birmingham, Alabama, our children crying out for brotherhood were answered with fire hoses, snarling dogs, and even death. I am mindful that only yesterday in Philadelphia, Mississippi, young people seeking to secure the right to vote were brutalized and murdered. 
I'm mindful that debilitating and grinding poverty afflicts my people and chains them to the lowest rung of the economic ladder. Therefore, I must ask why this prize is awarded to a movement which is beleaguered and committed to unrelenting struggle, to a movement which has not yet won the very peace and brotherhood which is the essence of the Nobel Prize. This Martin Luther King vignette was brought to you by Comcast, the Pennsylvania Lottery, Pico, Keystone First, and the Philadelphia Water Department. Don't forget to join Word Radio this Monday, January 15th, as we continue to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. At Donors Choose, we want students and teachers to have the tools they need for a great education. And now, more than ever, they need your support. Learn more at DonorsChoose.org. Donors Choose. Support a classroom. Build a future. And now back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, 900 AM and 96.1 FM, Philadelphia. Welcome back to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM, in conversation with Miss Joanne Bell, Kayla J, and Brother Samari, all hosts here at WRD. We've been having this conversation, and I just want to get your thoughts on this as we wrap up this incredible panel. You know, we talk about Obama, and then obviously there's extraordinary backlash to the first black president. You get Trump in response, or you sometimes the, the arc is a little bit longer. You know, you get affirmative action, you start to see after decades of affirmative action, you start to see folks emerge in the in the highest annals of power and spaces and then push back against affirmative action. You know, we probably are of differing opinions about this, but you have, you know, years of of progress around reproductive rights and women's rights. And then you get the rollback of, of, of Roe v. Wade. You know, I, I would like for each of you to kind of weigh in on the kind of pendulum swing uh, sort of politics of the world that we live in where we make these, I mean, this is what Ms. Bell was talking about from the beginning, like we make these steps forward, but then there, there's the pushback. How do we, how do we manage that or engage that, especially as, as folks who have media platforms and have to try to chart this stuff in both the, you know, in, in the kind of short term, medium term and, and, and long term. And, and Ms. Joanne, I'll, I'll start with you on that. How, how do you, how do you, how do we manage that, that phenomenon where the pendulum swings and sometimes swings really hard and really fast? Well, first I want to congratulate you on, on the show and, and as the new host. Thank you. Um, and then second, I want to say, I think what we have to be clear about is that what we are looking at is white fright that, that there is a fear that of the browning of America. Mm. And so th there is a need to turn the clock back. Mm -hmm. And what we have found is somewhere around 2012 or 13, the, there were more white deaths than there were births for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And now as that, that year that we thought that the change was going to happen, it keeps moving up. And so we have people clutching at the last vestiges of white supremacy mm -hmm. and so therefore abortion is not about any religious belief but it is about putting women back in their place having them go home and have these babies mm -hmm. and it really isn't about black women having babies it's about controlling black bodies mm -hmm. but it's really about white women having babies to replenish the population mm -hmm. and so there is everything that you see that's being done is being done with intentionality mm. because it, it, it's after you have the symbol of Barack Obama standing there as the leader of the free world that in their mind should never happen again in America to them is a white country mm -hmm. and it is not multicultural and that is what immigrate we can't kid ourselves that's what immigration is about that's what abortion is about that is what's turning the clocks back on affirmative action is about mm. and once we understand that's what we're up against then we ought to know how to arm ourselves in order to address it mm. kayla J, I see you shaking your head over there t t t talk about what's on your mind yeah she she's she's absolutely right um 
everything she said is correct. When it comes down for the reversal of Roe versus Wade, when it comes to affirmative action being talked about, when it when it even comes down to uh, for millennials, student loans being repaid, mm. right? Oh, only if you make this certain amount of money. If if you if you make this amount, we can't repay you, or we can put you in this pl payment plan. It is it's it's all about our color. It's all about controlling uh, our dollars. It's about controlling our bodies. It's about controlling what we can do. Um, America was already stolen, right? It was mm -hmm. it was never the white man's. The white man stole it, and and when they stole it, they said, "We'll silence the people that was here, and we'll change everything to make it fit us." And just as Joanne said, when you see. A, a, a darker pigmented man, a, a man rich in melanin, standing up <laughs> saying, I'm the president of the United States. And I say it that way because we have to remember that he is biracial, right? Mm -hmm. He identifies as black, but when someone sees him, he's just rich in melanin. And they like, that cannot happen again. We won't let it happen again. And then for a few years later to have a woman rich in melanin standing there saying she's vice president, mm -hmm. it is going to be an uproar because they see, oh, wow, they're, they're starting to figure out the game plan. They're starting to figure out the tricks of the trade and make it somewhere. Mm -hmm. We can't keep letting this happen because if they keep making it up, we'll lose our stance, we'll lose our ground, and we'll lose our place. Mm -hmm. Brother Shamari, you want to weigh in on this truth-telling session here? Yeah, and you know, and that's why I, I, what, I think it's important that we understand it's always going to be about race at the core because you know, I think about Bacon's Rebellion, right? Mm -hmm. Right, like like when when that last kick of the dying mule uh, called white colonialism, you know, it's the most dangerous kick, and that 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 mule, the colonial mule, is dying, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had, you know, what what always happens is the race card gets played. You know, you used to have to say you know, about black people playing the race race card, but white elite power always plays the race card, and that is it, it, it relies on the allegiance of the white suffering class and the white lower class because that's the only thing they can hold on to in the covenant is they ain't black, at least they ain't black. And so they always are leveraged to you, leveraged to hold up mm, the mm, very system mm. that's oppressing them as well. And so that, that's that backlash moment that we're in. So I, you know, I know you are closing remarks. I'm going to get a couple things in that I didn't say. I, one of the things I do appreciate about Dr. King um, is class suicide. That in many ways, I think that we don't really understand how privileged the background he came from mm. in his family. And that still to take on the weight of the struggling masses of black people and their disenfranchisement, mm -hmm. even though as an individual, he could have lived a pretty comfortable life. Mm -hmm. I always, you know, whatever my challenges are about him and whatever the case may be, I always raise that up. Mm -hmm. That in many ways he took on something uh, on behalf of the collective that he himself could have actually ignored and li lived a pretty privileged life. Mm -hmm. And so, um, also, in what you were saying, the irony about all of these people who are, you know, pushing back and, 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 and you know, engaged in the white backlash, often when you listen to them, they will, they will try to ground their resistance, their pushing back against black advancement, in the words of Dr. King. You know, so they'll be against DEI or they'll be against affirmative action because Dr. King said it's the content of your they character. They love that content right? of your character quote. They no, no, love that, Brother Samara. So I, so we got to be careful about, you know, you know how the rhetoric and the narrative goes. And last, last, last I would say, that's, you know, the, our call right now is the difference between indoctrination and instruction. And just like Kelly Jay said earlier about her generation, like that's because we haven't instructed well around the lessons learned such that we passed it down to generations in an institutional way, mm -hmm. such that we're not always starting from zero or we're not already always starting from being misinformed or, or misunderstanding the concept of the reality that we now find ourselves in. We got to take more ownership of the instruction of our people through institution building so that we're always clear about the the context that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Th thank you so much for that, Brother Shamari. Can, also, I just wanted, as part of your closing remarks, give give us like a, the presence of your show. Give give us a, a one-minute primer of 
what what your what your shows. And I want and, and, and Miss Joanne and Kayla Jay, when you guys give closing remarks, same thing. Well, talk talk to, to to the audience a little bit about your shows. Yeah, I come on uh, twice so far. Fridays from one to four, and then again on Sundays from six to eight. Fridays is called Groundings, Evolutions, Elevations with Brother Shamari. Sundays is uh, the arc. And at the core, you know, I'm trying to make black culture and Pan-Africanism common sense and common culture again. Mm. Just, just we got to return to ourselves. We got to get grounded in the wisdom of our ancestors and our, our ancient cultures that have really always guided us guided us. Even mm. when we thought, you know, Nat Turner was returning to Christianity. No, nah, Nat Turner was returning to the sense of his African self. Mm. You know, our, our Haitian brothers and sisters who, who engineered the Haitian Revolution, they did so when they returned to their African way. When, when, when the Weldon brothers wrote uh, the national anthem, the last line is true to our gods, mm -hmm. true to our native land. So we got to make our culture common again, and that's the goal on Fridays and Sundays. Mm, thank, thank you, good brother. Ms. Joanne, your closing remarks, and, and please, a little bit about um, the Black Women's Leadership Council. So the Black Women's Leadership Council, we have a group of uh, black women who are, are make, make up the council from various different groups that they've been involved with. And we cer certainly want to change, you know, the dynamics in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, uh, I, I want to say that I'm unapologetic about the stances that I take. Um, I'm willing to take my licks and smacks, but I'm gonna say what I wanna say. <laughs> and so it makes it very uh, colorful between the hours of 11 and one on Fridays. Um, we, we will cover with all intentionality, um, this upcoming uh, race uh, for uh, the president and for uh, for the Senate, because we believe that it's important, and we will we will impart the information that we think our listeners needs to know, and we keep a score scorecard. Mm -hmm. So, and we put out a ballot, and so at the at the for the primary and the general election, look forward to our ballot. We also have uh, events that we do so that we invite people in so that they can hear candidates. But we're going to be very intentional this year about saving our democracy. We really do think that it is um, it is in trouble. Mm. And so listen to us on uh, Fridays 11 to 1. And again, uh, congratulations. Thank you so much, Ms. Joanne. Uh, uh, Kayla J., your closing remarks and, and a little bit about Sunday morning praise. So, yes, publicly, let me uh, congratulate you, Doc. I call him lovely Doc, but Dr. Peterson on uh, coming back to uh, WRD with Evening Words. Super excited to hear you in the drive time. Uh, but in closing remarks, I just want to encourage people. We always just focus on the I have a dream, right? And last year, mm -hmm. I posed the question, do you have a dream too? I have a dream too. What is your dream? We're always talking about Martin's dream fulfilled mm. but what are your dreams what are your aspirations because he was living out his dream he was doing his dream we have to do ours and that is what helped his dream come true now unless your dream is something way off the walls don't don't do <laughs> your dream but uh fulfill fulfill your dream go out there and make a difference um mm. now on sunday mornings i like to say get ready for church with me from 6 to 11 a.m uh for sunday morning praise we have a good hand clapping foot stomping time in the lord i like to call it a one day revival because you get all you need mm. in those five hours uh we have music that can touch every generation and when i say every generation i mean every generation from your young your young kids your grandchildren who listen to christian hip-hop to the seasoned saint uh sitting in your living room that listen to mahalia jackson we gonna cover it all i give you a church of the week in a verse of the day uh, just to get you going. And I also want to encourage people to rise early with me too because Sunday Morning Praise is my main show, but we also do morning inspiration every morning from 3 to 5 a.m. here on WURD as well. Mm, that's early. Mm, that is <laughs> Good Lord, that is early. Are you kidding me? Whoa. <laughs> that that got to be some tape recording going on there. That's, that's what I was going to say. That's God's that. work. That's, that's God's work. That's God's work for three years. Uh, brother to brother Peterson, I want to express my congratulations. Thank you so much, so brother. I'm just Shemar. finding out about it as as people over the segment. So congratulations. No, no, thank, thank, thank you all. For, and first of all, thank you all so much for joining me on my on my debut and giving up all this time and all this 
uh, this great insight and great energy. I actually hope we can do more of these. I think we need more WRD hosts uh, around roundtable. So, so, so thank you all so much. Uh, for 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 joining me here you're listening to evening words i'm your host dr james peterson we're live on wrd 900 am 96.1 fm we're going to open up the phone lines for the rest of the program at 215-634-8065 i've been in conversation over the last couple of segments with miss joanne bell who's the co-host of black women's leadership council which airs on wrd on fridays from 11 a.m to 1 p.m with Reverend Kayla J, host of Sunday Morning Praise, which airs on Sundays from 6 to 11 a.m. And then she does something else that's just God's work from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. every morning. I don't even know what that is. And Brother Shamari, host of Groundings on Friday from 1 to 4 p.m. and The Ark on Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m. I am very, very grateful to have you all as colleagues, and thank you so much for joining me here on my debut. We'll be back after these messages. Teachers are dynamic leaders, shaping a new generation. They bring a variety of perspectives from diverse backgrounds, innovating how they teach to prepare students for our fast-changing world. Achieving this takes skill and expertise. They're tireless explorers, creatively discovering a universe of solutions, telling stories, experimenting, inspiring, mentoring, Connecting cultures and connecting with each other. Leading by example. Experience the unique joy of helping students thrive. Teaching is a journey that shapes lives. Are you ready to begin? Explore teaching at teach.org. A campaign supported by the U.S. Department of Education, teach.org, and one million teachers of color. April 5th was a breakthrough day. Once, there was a very silly bear. During a well visit at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Primary Care, Zach got his very first book. Let's point to the bear. And his mom got advice and support about the importance of reading to her nine-month-old. Very good. The Reach Out and Read program at CHOP has helped thousands of families open a whole new world for their children through early That's reading. right. He's right there. Every day, Children's Hospital is making breakthroughs for kids. Some big, some small, all wondrous. And they had a very good day. <laughs> Zach's breakthrough, lots of happy endings that add up to a great beginning. What can we do for your child today? Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Breakthroughs every day. Yours begins at chop.edu. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with RAIN. Join RAIN in the fight against sexual violence and volunteer in your community. Log on to RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G, to learn how you can be the someone. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. And now, back to Evening Words with Dr. James Peterson on WURD, Progressive Black Talk Media. Welcome back to Evening Words. I'm your host, Dr. James Peterson. We are live on WRD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. If you want to join the conversation these last few minutes that we have here on this great MLK Day, uh, do give us a call, 215-634-8065. We'll pop over to the phone lines. We have Brenda from South Philly. Miss Brenda, welcome to Evening Words. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, well, Dr. Peterson, I want to learn a little bit more about you. Okay. So tell me, um, well, what what did you get your doctorate in? Mm -hmm. What kind of work have you done? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, tell us a little bit about your family as well. Your 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 immediate family, okay? I absolutely will. Thank you so much for that call and those questions. Um, so my PhD is in English um, from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I graduated with my doctorate in late 2003. Um, my focus has always been African-American literature and black culture. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on concepts of the underground uh, in, in, in black culture. Ended up becoming my, my first book uh, years, years later in 2014. Um, I, I, I'm a writer, I think, uh, by, by trade, I guess. And so I've written a few books. Um, um, I write for the Philadelphia Citizen, where I have a byline, and 
And in fact, um, yeah, I'll try to post the link to my MLK piece uh, on our on our Facebook feed, and and I'm hoping to be able to do some writing uh, right here at WRD. Um, I split my time between doing a lot of things uh, professionally, but but writing and and media and journalism is is the primary piece right now. Um, I come from a big family uh, out of Newark, New Jersey. Shout out to my mom and my dad and and all of my siblings who are listening and texting and showing me love in every way that they can. And um, I am married to one of the most extraordinary people in the world, Dr. Belinda Waller-Peterson. Uh, and the Waller family is also here, right here from um, uh, Philadelphia. And so I, I believe my in-laws, uh, Valerie and Reginald Waller are listening. I think my brother-in-law, Reginald Jr., I hope little Reggie is listening. I got a lot of family in and around Philadelphia and around the area. Um, I have two extraordinary children. Uh, my son, James Peterson, who was born on my birthday. Uh, almost 25 years ago. I can't believe my son is about to be 25. My lovely and talented daughter, Brianna Peterson, uh, who will be turning, somehow she'll be turning 23. That's my baby. We'll be turning 23 here in a few weeks. And so um, uh, Dr. Belinda, uh, 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 James, and and um, uh, Brianna, that's that's my core nucleus family. But I have a lot of if I were to start talking about my siblings and my cousins and my nephews and you know all of that, you know what I'm saying? It would it would take more time uh, than I have. But I have a a, a great big old uh, 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 loving family. Shout out to my nephew Aaron, who's who's texting me right now. Um, uh, and shout out to my whole family. Uh, but Miss Brenda, I really appreciate that call. We're gonna stay on the phone lines. I I gotta take. This quick call. I have a special guest for y'all. I got a special, special, special guest for y'all. But I'm going to take one more call before I take that guest. Miss Sadie, welcome to Evening Words. Now, Miss Sadie, even before you start, Miss Sadie, before you start, before you start, before you start. You, I am, you have no idea. I hope I don't get put out of my apartment. Because when she made the announcement, I started running. Now I live in an apartment, right? Yes. I'm like, yes, yes, I knew it. I knew it. The people downstairs, I thought, but the bottom line was somebody came and knocked on my door and asked me was I okay. But that's okay. <laughs> oh, you know what? Your protest was successful, Miss Sadie. Your protest see, was successful. See? see? Listen, prayer changes things. Yes, it does. And when they say God doesn't make any mistakes, usually they're talking about something else. Mm. But we've been waiting for this. And I'm going to take the liberty to speak to everybody that's a WURD listener and member. This is what we've been waiting for. And it's been more than worth the wait, and I'm going to hang up before I start bawling. Thank you, Miss Sadie. Congratulations to you and your entire family. Thank you, Miss Sadie. I, I appreciate <laughs> okay. that. Talk uh, to you another time. Bye. Say, for sorry, thank you so much. If y'all don't know, Miss Sadie was has been calling up uh, when I'm guest hosting, just showing me love, but also like mounting you like a one woman protest. Like we got to have you on here. We want you on here, and so so I really appreciate her and her persistence. Uh, and her excitement about about today. Now, now we got a few minutes left here, but I got a special guest for y'all. And you know, when it comes to MLK Day, you know, there's always one person I want to talk to. One person I want to I want to know what this person's day was like and what is going on in this person's mind because he is an extraordinary scholar of MLK and MLK's life, but also someone who has lived a life that has tried to walk the path of the civil rights legacy to which we all owe our current station in progress in this in this great nation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. Reverend Dr. James Braxton Peterson, it's great to be on the show with you. I'm like Sister Sadie. I was out here protesting to the universe. She was more verbal in her articulation, but you deserve this show. The city of Philadelphia deserves to hear you. The nation needs your conscientious voice. And uh, what I did today, I read a piece called MLK and the Limitless Legacy of Hope, <laughs> one of the most brilliant interpretations of Dr. King and Brief Scope that I've read. Oh, and uh, I had the pleasure today to speak at the King Memorial itself, mm. uh, dedicated to the memory of Dr. King uh, in the cold in Washington, D.C. But Dr. King weathered bad storms for us to be able to rise to where we are, and I'm grateful that uh, the announcement has gone forth that this is your spot and your slot 
because we need you more than ever, my friend. Mm, thank, thank, thanks, Doc. I mean, talk, talk a little bit more about, I saw some images from it, but can you share with our audience a little bit about what your remarks were um, at, at the King Memorial? I, I saw that you were there with, with Martin King uh, the third, and with the family members and with you know all the officials and all the important folks. But talk a little bit about what your remarks were at the King Memorial today. Yes, sir. Well, I wanted to make plain that Dr. King was about service, Dr. King was about love, and Dr. King was about justice. Mm. And those are the three points I wanted to hammer home. You know, Dr. King said everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Because service was the litmus test for him of a life committed to others. Mm. And then secondly, love, you know, how we need to hear that word now. He didn't mean the sappy, sentimental expression of you know, uh, personal uh, erotic love. He meant self-giving, self-sacrificing love for the other that could transform the nation in which we live. And then thirdly, justice. And as I've said so many years ago, justice is what love sounds like when it speaks in public. Mm. And Dr. King wanted to speak the public language of love, which is justice, to make sure that gay and lesbian and transgendered and bisexual people would receive their just due, that African-American people would receive their just due, that Jews and Palestinians would receive mm. their just due, that mm. all human beings whose backs are against the wall and who fight for recognition in the midst of a culture that has refused to acknowledge our humanity um, deserve to be celebrated. I talked about Claudine Gay. And plagiarism, and, and I spoke about how this nation has done unjustly uh, to black people in positions of authority and power and the hypocrisy that reigns. Mm. And here we are trying to, you know, ban books of black people when indeed black history is American history. So there's so much more to be said, mm -hmm. but I tried to drive home the point of service of love and of justice. That's incredible, Doc. You know, we're, we're, you know, there's so many things I want to talk about. I want to talk about Cat Williams, but we don't have time. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. But we're, you know, we are entering into the next presidential season and cycle. And it, it just, it seems so strange to me. And it's someone who's going to be sitting in this seat and trying to report on it and talk about it. I mean, there's a lot of frustration about the options that are available uh, to us or people's perception of what those options are. A lot of frustration about about the uh, Trump candidacy, much less a, a Trump presidency. Some frustration about the Biden administration and its capacity to tell the story about its impact, if it's had any impact on the lives of black folks. I mean, can you hand, handicap this? this cycle for me like what are you seeing i know you're going to be asked to move around and do a whole lot i'm not asking you to endorse anyone here um but but talk a little bit about about from from the perch of of, of mlk day 2024 how do you see the, the the upcoming uh electoral cycle for for president of the united states i unapologetically endorse joe Biden. look <laughs> he, he ain't he ain't perfect but as grace jones said i may not be perfect but i'm perfect for you Here's the point. Is he, is he perfect? No. Has he uh, failed on uh, some issues? Yes. Is he flawed? Yes. Would we wish him to be more aggressive about issues in the Middle East? Yes. Would we want him to be more balanced there? Yes. Would we want him to tell a narrative that really begins to articulate what he has done for African-American people here? Yes. But see, Negroes get real funny. When Joe Biden proved he was inside the culture when he said, if you don't vote for me, you ain't really black, that was one of the blackest things ever said. And you want white people to be inside your culture, but when they get inside your culture, you get resentful. So let me tell you young people out here listening and those people who have nurtured a kind of skepticism about the possibility that voting will not result in what you want. It don't never do that, dog. Mm. Voting is never the full panacea that some have argued, but it is a stopgap measure, and it is a transformative tool of democracy. Think about it. Had the vote come out differently in 2016, or even before that, when Donald Trump went in, first went into office, well, in, in 2016, then the reality is this, is that he wouldn't have been in place and position to put three people on the Supreme mm, Court, mm, mm. which has 
shifted the mm. power alignment in American society when it comes to affirmative action and when it comes to abortion. Mm. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. All of your nurse leftist progressive ideals, of which I hold many of them in my breath, but at the same time, if Angela Davis could stand with, with Joe Biden, mm. Noam Chomsky could stand with Joe Biden. Yeah, if you've got to clench your nose, clench your nose. But get into the, the, the thick of the matter. This is too serious for us to be having idealized, idealistic uh, arguments about the potential outcomes of our vote when the democracy is in crisis and our people's backs are against the wall. Joe mm. Biden is the best option for us, given everything that is available. Otherwise, it's a vote for Donald Trump. Otherwise, it's a vote for Ron DeSantis. Otherwise, it's a vote for Nikki Haley. No third party has a realistic chance of uh, winning. They can siphon off a vote uh, for Joe Biden. They can detract people, distract people from the real issue here, which is are we going to collapse and capitulate to fascism or will we stand high on the high ground for truth, justice, and democracy. So I think on Dr. King's what would have been his 95th birthday, hmm. I make an endorsement of Joe Biden on your show because that is the best choice and option we have in America right now. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, I love you, brother. Thank you so much for calling up tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. I hope you will come back on this program early and okay. often, as they used to say. I would, I would love to hang out with you, Doc, because you're doing a great job, and for a great intellectual like you, to have a weekly show where people can hear from you routinely is one of the greatest gestures of service, love, and justice one might imagine. Thank you, Dr. Dyson. I appreciate you. God bless you, Dr. Dyson. Thank you. God bless you, too, brother. You have been listening to Evening Words and uh, my debut as, as the host of the program. We've been live here on WORD, 900 AM, 96.1 FM. I want to thank Sarah Lomax and the whole team here, so many people work so hard on this show. Thank you, Ashanti. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jordan. So much work went in to this show, and I just appreciate everybody and, and all the guests, the hosts showing up for me. I want to thank Imani Miles and her incredible students. I want to thank that brother Jamal Johnson for hugging the block for all of us. While we sit here and talk about it, he's hugging the block for all of us. And obviously, I want to thank my good friend dr dyson for for closing me out here um you know i'll be back here tomorrow god willing